So here we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the symposium Textual Heritage for the 21st Century, exploring the potential of a new analytic category. I am very pleased to see that so many people are interested in what we hope may represent a challenging topic for many of us working in the fields of the humanities and social sciences. I wish to thank in advance the nine participants who prepared a paper for this symposium and to extend my gratitude to our two keynote speakers, Professor Witke Deneke of MIT, who is joining us from Boston, where it is still very early in the morning, and Professor David Charles Harvey of Aarhus University in Denmark. My name is Eduardo Gerlini. I am a Marie Curie Global Fellow at the Department of Asian and North African Studies at Kafoska University of Venice, which is hosting this symposium. Um, the symposium itself started as a spin-off of my Marie Curie research titled World Heritage and East Asian Literature, Cinetic Writings in Japan as Cultural Heritage. But as you can understand from the program, our event is not confined, confined to either Japan or literature. On the contrary, it is our hope to go beyond uh, disciplinary borders, embracing a truly transnational and interdisciplinary perspective. I will take just another minute for the institutional greetings, starting from the top global university project at Waseda University in Tokyo, as well as the Waseda Comprehensive Research Organization and the Research Institute of Japanese Classical Books that supported this project since its earliest stage. On the European side, um, I wish to express my gratitude to the Horizon 2020 program of the European Commission, which provided financial support for my research up to this symposium. And finally, I wish to say grazie to all the colleagues here at Kafoskari who helped me making this interdisciplinary event possible. The Department of Humanities, the Research Institute for Digital and Cultural Heritage, and the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. Uh, we reached over 100 people registered for the symposium, and I take this as a proof of the good work of networking everybody did. So again, thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Dr. Andrea Giolai of Leiden University, who organized this symposium with me. Please, Andrea. Grazie, thank you, Eduardo, and hello, everyone. Um, welcome. It's, it's wonderful to see so many uh, people showing up despite the difficult time difference and, uh, and being, having um, both presenters and attendees from different continents, different time zones. So thank you very much. Uh, let me just briefly join uh, Eduardo in thanking the numerous institutions that made, made the event possible. And it is both a pleasure and a privilege to be part of the organization of the symposium. I will do my best to keep my comments really brief. Uh, just a few words to explain how the idea behind the symposium came about as a kind of uh, giving, providing some context. Um, both Eduardo and myself are interested in broad question, in the broad question of how certain objects and practices become heritage. Of course, we also share a professional interest in Japan. Uh, Eduardo works on written sources that belong to Japanese literary heritage, while I deal with the sonic actualization of musical notations. Our collaboration began a couple of years ago in 2019, I think, with a panel we co-chaired on Japanese cultural heritage and its texts, that was the title. And then the collaboration continued last year again in the context of a very large conference, the Association of Critical Heritage Studies. So why texts and why textual heritage? First of all, because we noticed, like we say in the um, call for paper, we originally in, in December, uh, we noticed that even though books and manuscripts and other textual products have a very significant, significant cultural capital in many societies, uh, they are notably absent from inter interdisciplinary debates over intangible cultural heritage. This is quite surprising, and Eduardo in particular has worked quite a lot um, to show how the Japanese example is quite, of eccentric, quite eccentric compared to, um, compared to what big institutions like UNESCO consider heritage. 
Um, furthermore, and I think this is where my own contribution becomes a bit more clear, we both noticed that our research did not sit well with rigid binary oppositions. Uh, recent approaches to heritage have emphasized the intangibility of much of the so-called heritage practices. But at the same time, um, for instance, in my case, musicians often worry deeply about their textual tradition, uh, both in terms of authenticity, in brackets, and in terms of authority. So examples from my own fieldwork, for instance, demonstrate that a rigid separation of texts and sounds, and con consequently of the visual on the one hand and the oral on the other, is not really aligned with the experiences of those who are actually involved in the making of heritage. Uh, so personally, I welcome and wish to convey to you this kind of intellectual challenge of thinking about what a text can be, and also to quote the famous philosopher, what texts can do. Um, we ask provocative questions on the relation between uh, different materialities and how to think beyond the categories of tangible and intangible. And this is in a nutshell, the reason for my own involvement as well. Uh, that being said, this is probably the first symposium entirely dedicated to the concept of textual heritage or to be more clear, um, the, the how the concept of cultural heritage can be applied and related to texts uh, and writing. And we conceive by now, you probably have noticed, we conceive texts and writing in a very wide and very inclusive way. Terms like textual heritage or literary heritage are not completely new, uh, not completely unheard of, but we do think that uh, a more specific definition of textual heritage is necessary, as well as deeper inquiries about the role of written text in the definition of heritage, especially in the new and interdisciplinary field of heritage studies. So in our call for paper from last December, we also said that we were going to welcome theoretical contribution and case studies engaging with the concept of textual heritage um, and um, exploring how texts are produced, used, and, and recreated. We wish to do this in both an interdisciplinary and transnational uh, way. And we wished, um, we selected therefore contributions dealing with topics that spread um, very far, very wide from East to West, from Japan to India, from North Africa to North Europe, focusing in, in different fields, focusing on different fields um, or disciplines. So we have literature, history of art, history, translation studies, and more. Of course, there are many more um, fields and areas which, with which we would like to open a dialogue. And, um, but we would like to start from here to have this, this symposium as a sort of a kicking off a larger, um, more, vibrant collaborations across. Finally, let me just uh, restate that we know that for those of you living outside of Europe, the, the schedule is a little bit tight and tiring uh, because of different time zones, but we do hope you will stay with us for the three days. And we wish to create meaningful connect connections that will extend, of course, well beyond these three days. Uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Giolini, I would also uh, like to wish you all a very pleasant three days. We hope you will enjoy the many topics in the program and starting from the first very exciting keynote presentation uh, by Professor Deneke, to which we now turn. So I leave the floor again to Eduardo. Thank you, Andrea. And then it's with great pleasure that I introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Vipke Deneke. Uh, professor Deneke is currently visiting professor of East Asian Literatures and Comparative Literature at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is a renowned specialist of East Asia and world literature, being the editor of important book series and publications on literature, as the Norton Anthology of World Literature, the uh, Su Tang Library of Classical Chinese Literature for Oxford University Press, and the book series, East Asian Comparative Literature and Culture for Brill. 
Uh, her research encompasses the literary and intellectual history of pre-modern China, Japan, and Korea, comparative studies of East Asia and the pre-modern world, world literature and the politics of cultural heritage and memory. I would like to mention one of her books in particular, titled Classical World Literatures, Sino-Japanese and Greco-Roman Comparisons for Oxford University Press, that is a groundbreaking work that, in my opinion, opens a totally new scenario for the study of classical culture in general, not only related to East Asia and Greco-Roman classics. And I really suggest you to give it a look if you don't know that. Uh, Professor Deneke is also co-editor, together with Professor Kono Kimiko of Waseda University, of a three-volume history of Japanese literature in which she proposed a total rethinking of the concept of literature in pre-modern East Asia uh, with the neologism of literature, uh, L-E-T-T-E-R-A-T-U-R-R, -E -E -R, so not I, but E, uh, from letters. And with this, uh, she tried to criticize the Western idea of literature applied to non-Western countries, especially in pre-modern times. And it's exactly because her ability in criticizing and rethinking things and disciplines from a different perspective that we strongly wanted her to be our first keynote speaker uh, for this symposium today, um, as well as a discussant for the final round table we will have Wednesday. So uh, Professor Denike's talk today is titled Textual Heritage, Deja Vu or Catalyst for History Making and Writing. And I guess it will probably anticipate many central problems we will discuss uh, during the following three days. So Professor Deneke, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for this very kind introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much for organizing this conference. Who wouldn't want to be in Venice right now? Uh, but on the other hand, I think the kind of group we have at the moment couldn't come together other than on Zoom. So we have to be grateful for that too. But thank you for organizing uh, this on such an exciting topic. Uh, since I'm not a heritage scholar, which you'll see in a minute, and I'll be talking about, uh, I'm particularly excited uh, really to learn a lot over the next few days. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And before that, I should actually mention uh, that, as you know, all kinds of things happen during pandemic fatigue. Um, only this morning did I realize that actually my talk should be 30 minutes and then 15 minutes discussion instead of 45 minutes and 15 minutes discussion. So what I'll be doing is I'll be taking you through things a little bit more quickly, follow the color scheme that will is helpful, it's always helpful in life. Uh, and really, I apologize for, the, for, the, for, for that kind of misunderstanding and, um, and for the, the quicker kind of pace here. But uh, let's dive right in. Let me see. Can you all see this? Yes. Good, good, good. So let's start framing this problem. <laughs> That's why I chose this, this image, you know, of a traditional book. Let me see. Um, so just a few words about the trajectory of this lecture today. First of all, I'll be talking about what I call the pleasures of the problem, heritage and me. And I can tell you in the 20 years I've been giving to, uh, academic talks, I never called anything XXX and me. <laughs> but it is something that started for me in a very personal way. And now I have the chance to really think through it academically, which is wonderful. Uh, then I move on to the problems of the problem, kind of an attempt to frame for me what is, are the challenges in thinking about textual and also heritage now. In part two, I'll move on to really thinking about the potential of the concept of textual heritage. And I guess that will be the main topic really of all presentations. I will focus in particular on the question of what textual heritage can contribute to history making, or I also call it historiography, but in the broader sense of all, way, all kinds of types of writing the past. We always do that when we deal with the past and write about it. Now we are doing something historiographical. And I'll talk a little bit also about the relationship between textual heritage and documentary heritage, which is a UNESCO category, and ask what the surplus would be for textual heritage. 
In part three, I take you to actually a research topic of mine now where only in the middle of research, I realized, wow, this is actually part of the Memory of the World program. Uh, registered in 2017, the case of the Korea's Chosun missions to Tokugawa, Japan. And I'll end on some prospects here, how to do things with concepts. Andrea already mentioned that, how to do things with words. But really, what can we do with that new category, no? very concretely, to think about that? And as you see, the sun just came up here in Boston. I hope it's kind of fine. <laughs> but, uh, that's, uh, that's what you see here. So. A few years ago, uh, when I met Eduardo at a conference in Tokyo, I really felt caught in the act because he said, oh, I saw you published this chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Classic Chinese Literature on shared literary heritage in the East Asian Sinographic sphere. So all those countries that use Chinese characters and rely on Chinese canons. Uh, great that you inherited studies and so on. And I was like, really sorry, I didn't think about that. I just thought of the fact that for 1300 years, classical Chinese was used in Japan in the 20th century that died out due to kind of the national moment, uh, national movement. Uh, and that's why I call it now heritage, you know? And I really felt at some point I need to think about this. Uh, so uh, this is the part about heritage and mean. So my research scope, as Eduardo mentioned, is classic literatures of the so-called Sinographic sphere, China, Japan, Korea, also Vietnam. Um, and I'm particularly also interested in kind of multiliterate literary cultures now. So cultures where you have cosmopolitan languages, let's say Latin in Europe, you know, classical Chinese, literary Chinese or literary Sinitic uh, in East Asia uh, that coexist with vernaculars. Um, and I'm very interested in comparing that kind of poetry. So my personal concern has always been, where is Sinitic poetry now in the 20th, 21st century, when basically this practice of writing it in East Asia has kind of died out? Where is it still alive in Japanese society and so on? Um, and whenever I spend a large, you know, more time in Japan, I actually participated in the circle of so-called Shigin, or literary Sinitic poetry recitation. And I had to handle these kind of scores. I know there are colleagues out there who really know what this is all about, but I had to do this as an amateur. Um, and I was taken to these events, uh, for example, the Hizensai um, at Dai Tokuji, which gave me a great opportunity to see the wonderful bamboo garden that you usually don't get into in, to uh, in Kyoto. Uh, and this was a, a, a kind of a ceremony for the founder of that particular lineage of Shigin. Uh, and one of the memorable events for me really uh, where I felt like for the first time, oh my God, heritage is such an important topic, is that this man here, after the ceremony where, you know, we performed and so on, and of course I had to do a little speech because I was kind of the total foreigner. You see here, if you read Japanese, you know, Denike san is the, the German girl was there, you know, so they gave this to me afterwards. So this man came up to me and said, you know what, we really need help. Shigin is dying. It's only elderly people doing it. Why don't you help us having this registered with UNESCO? And I felt so ambivalent at that moment because I felt like the intruder. And they are looking up to me as the intruder to help them actually kind of preserve something they see that's dying and that's extremely dear to them and personal. No? Um, so I also organized with a teacher now uh, while I was a visiting professor at Doshisha in Kyoto. Uh, some events on Shigin so that actually international students and some Japanese students could actually be exposed to that too. Um, so much about that. So I had this nagging question all the time. Why do my colleagues who are actually researching Japanese Sinitic poetry not really care about where it's now? No, Because I really felt like we are in this moment of world historical significance. The last time a logographic script, a script that's actually not based on an alphabet, but on uh, writing words, so to speak, died out was in the fourth century CE, you know, when basically cuneiform around that time and Egyptian hieroglyphs and so on died out. Uh, so really in that sense, seeing that wane, of, of course not in China and also not in Japan, but as a means of communication, no? I really felt that is, a that is a world historical moment, the last logographic scripture disappearing. And what do we do now with this literary inheritance? No? Um, and especially given that really Shigen, because it's Sinitic poetry, is very much marginalized, like Sino-Japanese literature studies in all, overall, as opposed to vernacular Japanese studies, national studies. 
And I really felt there is an incredible chance here to look at really the nature, the risk, the potential outcomes of this academic heritageization, you know, that's really happening before our eyes, but it's really not of, his, of, of, of any interest. And my question was, how can we help? How can I help the Shigen community, you know, and help them kind of cope with the anxiety of survival? And very important to say here that there's a huge difference to things like no or kabuki, because Shigen is part of Sinitic high culture. Nobody really wants that to be part of nation branding for Japan to some degree, no? I know there's going to be a talk on Renga. I very much look forward to that. Another Japanese um, uh, poetic form, how that lives on. Uh, but that was, those were really those kind of questions for me, no? So I call this now the showdown because I've had all these experiences and kind of a personal relationship to heritage <laughs> to some degree in these questions. But this conference really faced, you know, kind of forced me into the showdown mode. I need to face that problem somehow hands on. And so apolog I apologize if this is all, uh, you know, still very broad somehow. I look forward to your comments and corrections and so on. But really thinking through heritage, you know, they're the authorized heritage discourses now. What we'll be looking at in particular is the documentary, um, um, heritage discourse in relation uh, in the memory of the world program. Um, and some of the challenges of this, although this is also changing, but I'm just talking about more cliche prejudices is that this is of course more Eurocentric. Uh, there's still a sense, although often contested in literature now, that heritage is a 19th century European phenomenon. It's very much focused on monumenta in the Latin sense, on objects. It comes out of antiquarianism, of archeological traditions. And politically, it's very much bound to the nation state ideologies, obviously, because they often kind of submit uh, these applications and to a kind of European mission civilisatrice, no? So in that sense, and now I'm really painting a very dark picture, this idea it's abusable, invented, unauthentic, instrumentalized, it's monetizable. I just had a great talk with a, uh, with a, a very famous actually global historian uh, about heritage studies. And I really feel historians too, they, they, they're just like, oh, this is about tourism studies. No, there's a heritage industry. There's a lot of prejudice there. Um, on the other hand, you have in the broader sense that all kinds of varieties, heritage studies, you know, in academic institutions, very much, very important, the adjective here, critical heritage studies, uh, which often is more case study based and, and people kind of harp on how under theorized it is for that reason. And of course, another very important vector in, in close relationship to academic institutions uh, as UNESCO, of course, is too, of course, museums, historical societies and so on. And some of the challenges and paradoxes that I constantly feel, you know, reading through, you know, diving into a lot of this heritage studies literature is that on the one hand, there's this excitement that this is a paradigm that's much more democratic, it's participatory, it's vernacular. But on the other hand, it has to do with things like canonization and things like that. It's high culture, it's top down, canonical, uh, and there's some kind of attention here. And one question I'm particularly interested in and really look forward to hearing uh, your ideas is, is it actually under theorized or is it to some degree under theorizable? No, <laughs> I mean, of course, the genre of case studies means there's a little bit of frame, not too much and a lot of case study, often very data dense, that doesn't encourage so much theorization. But I also do feel like heritage studies, unlike a lot of other historical paradigms, that faces uh, constantly here, the color again, a crisis of scale. No? If you have a little text, how do you integrate that? to the reception history, to the intellectual history, the religious history, regionally, nationally, now globally. <laughs> There's a constant crisis of scale, how to really do this. So if, this is very hard to theorize now. And also I do feel sometimes that heritage studies is in between an approach and method rather than actually a corpus of text necessarily or a really a discipline in that sense that is focused around a corpus. And that means it is already theorized in some way. We just make to have to make that more explicit now. Um, so much on the heritage side. Now we get to this, I know, very dense picture. Sorry about that. One, you know, since I'm a literary historian, of course I have to deal with this question of where is history now, no? And I really want to venture, you know, this notion of history culture that I think actually in the English context is a mirror translation of German Geschichtskultur, a paradigm as you see up here. I hope you can see my cursor. Eduardo, can you see the cursor? Yes, good. Um, that actually developed in the 1990s in Germany. Somebody called Rüsen was very involved. It was also based on work by Kozelek. These were people who were thinking about questions of historical consciousness in each age. Uh, and also how to actually teach history, which is kind of a problem because 
the, the you know pedagogy of history of course isn't the real thing and in that sense a little bit marginalized but there's wonderful stuff on historical consciousness studies a fantastic handbook here a journal no uh, now actually the study of the ancient world and their historical consciousness comes out john baines is an egyptologist this starts with the hittite emperor uh, em uh, em empire and the historical consciousness there so history culture in the broader sense, I mean, this is kind of a paradigm broader, but in the broader sense is what I would call past making. It's just dealing with the past in some ways. And on the one hand, we still have this idea, this fetish of objectivity. It goes back to 19th century and Ranke who really wants to reconstruct how it has been and so on. It's still with us, but we also realize that it doesn't help us a lot. If you think about archeogenetics now, actually a new field that looks at the DNA of people, <laughs> to actually make statements about race, identity, culture, migration, and so on. The interesting thing there, I just went to a really interesting talk about that, is that, yes, you can find out that DNA sequence of people in, in graveyards in like late antiquity in Europe now, but it doesn't really tell you anything about the identity, the culture, the name of these tribes or these people involved. So there is the objectivity of the DNA, but in terms of historical study, no histor no, nothing gained, you know, in terms of comparing that to the, a text that survived with a lot of names of different, you know, different uh, people and ethnic groups. So I actually kind of very boldly put this now on a spectrum here from objectivity, DNA seems to be very objective, to authenticity. And I know this is a very, Andrea already said, you know, very problematic term, but in some ways memory studies now uh, and heritage studies, I think is, has that degree of authenticity in the sense of emphasizing human experience now it's not about the event back there but it's a lot about how do we as humans actually remember how do we as humans actually create communities based on that and identities these are the questions really of memory studies in the broader sense and heritage studies um, and i think in that sense uh, with this definition of authenticity you really have something that works differently in, in saying things about history. And of course, right in the middle here, we have history uh, with the age, you know, capital H, the discipline of history in our academic spectrum. And there's a clear sense there are harder types of history, softer types. I have ethnomusicology here too, intellectual and literary. Uh, really looking forward to all the talks from the music folks here. I think we really need that because it's so marginalized in historiography often. Um, so. I'm not going to go too much into uh, the idea here of memory studies. What I want to emphasize, though, is my sense overall is that the dialogue between heritage studies and history uh, as a discipline has really just begun. And it's a very important work. Professor Harvey has been doing some of this work. Uh, and in that sense, it's really something very important, I think, to do to make heritage studies, not just heritage studies, but part of past making and history in the broader sense, history, culture. Um, now, the one uh, kind of the two fields that have the most contact at the moment and actually still a very thunderous relationship, thus I have, therefore I have the little, <laughs> the little uh, red side here, is memory studies and history. And you might remember somebody like Pierre Nora talked about actually memory destroying history. The historians always being afraid of two subjectivist forms of history, writing, memory studies, oral, uh, oral history, stuff like that. It is quite interesting that that fetish with memory and history don't like each other that actually has has dominated very much like the second half of the 20th century is to some degree actually a creation really until the 19th century the Ciceronian model was very much there Cicero in De Oratore on the ideal orator talks about historia as actually a preservation of memory and memoria and in many ways history and memory were directly related and now that's not the case I mean it's a you know but in that sense, it is interesting. It's good that there's at least a dialogue, but there's still the sense like memory studies, well, is not quite as good in objective history. So this is the broad lay of the land that I made for myself, you know, facing this kind of showdown. Let's now really go on to this question of what's the potential you now of textual heritage. And as, I, as my title indicated, you know, there's a lot of my, some of us might feel like it's a deja vu, you no? Know? What does it really add? to the kind of approaches we have seen. And I'm not going to read all of this to you. Philology has a big hand in here. Literary and cultural studies, especially canonization processes, reception studies, library sciences, book studies, history of the book. Um, obviously, you know, UNESCO, why should we have textual heritage if there is documentary heritage already, no? Tangible, intangible heritage debates. 
And then the question, of course, and I'm really interested to hear from the heritage folks is, how is textual heritage new within, I mean, it is new in heritage studies, but what can it do for heritage studies now per se? Um, so overall, I just feel like there's a, an incredible potential in textual heritage to work as a heuristic catalyst to bring together all these different fields I just showed you, <laughs> you know, that are about a historical culture or, you know, approaches to the past and uh, kind of can really spawn new forms of historiography, again, in the broadest sense of writing about history. So the first point here would be introducing a new logic of historiography. No? Rather than having protagonists and heroes, we actually have the agency through texts, uh, through things, and through human practices. No? And there's a whole, there's so interesting work, work now being done in brain sciences on the embodied human condition. Unlike Ranka, I think we are much more humble about who we are, that we are not like you know, we're living in a platonic, you know, ideal cosmos, but we are very embodied and our senses and perceptions are very limited now. And very interesting theories about material engagement and vital materiality, like how objects interact with people and with practices, how objects are practices now in this wonderful Oxford handbook on history and material culture that just came out. I also think it, uh, the category of textual heritage could be a fantastic boost for comparative historiography. As some of you might know, comparative historiography is kind of a stepchild, often looked upon as, you know, not a very good, op, you know, doing good comparison is very difficult. And uh, especially with the recent hegemony of global history, that's all about reception. How do things spread? The comparison of actually material or histories that are not directly related historically and where things don't travel is something that has really kind of taken the back seat. And I think, you know, imagine you have a text, religious text, you know, from Japan, some kind of prayer text in the 8th century and then from Europe in the 12th century. There's no relationship between these practices or no exchange between those religions. But it might be really interesting to think about, like, how did these texts become heritageized? How did they become practices? We can compare that now. And it is, so in that sense, the, the important point I want to make here too is that I think comparative history is often a misnomer. You know, we can't compare Shakespeare with anybody in China no? uh, or Bismarck with anybody else, but we can actually comp compare processes. For example, processes like heritageization, canonization, you know, not the things themselves, but actually these kind of processes. And in that sense, I think textual heritage would give an incredible boost now. And Ruizen already understood that, um, the, the guy, you know, who developed this Geschichtskultur paradigm and uh, wrote, you know, had this whole volume uh, in, ahead of his time very much, I think, on intercultural comparative historiography. The other point I think that textual heritage can also really bring out uh, is just through it, the inertia of material culture. Texts because they exist, they have a kind of a power of presence and they're kind of numinous because often we don't know their histories, we try to find out, it's very detective work. And they can work as a kind of pièce de résistance to master narratives, no? And I want to give you a great example that, you know, was also very personal for me. Uh, last year in the fall, all of a sudden the Asai Shimbun brought an article. Here we have the oldest manuscript of the Confucian Analects, one of the most foundational texts of East Asian culture, now from the 6th to early 7th centuries. So far the oldest manuscripts we had were in China from 12th to 13th centuries and also in Japan from that time. Um, and actually it's quite interesting because the, the team who discovered that, actually the, the, the leader of that team, is my mentor in Japan and I know exactly which bookstore he went to when he found that manuscript which really is just made this huge splash and and I observed a little bit like what happened on blogs now and on sinological blogs you know China studies blogs there was immediately this feeling like oh my god they didn't mention the excavated bamboo text that we have from China you know the analects can't really be a Japanese text you know uh, and then, and, and nobody wrote back saying like, well, you know, this is a transmitted paper manuscript. That's what they're talking about. They don't try to take the heritage away from you, no. But it is interesting to see that kind of heritage competition. And I think here, this Analex manuscript here, this is book 10, one of my favorite books in the Analex, you know, um, can really help us denationalize uh, our current world and understand the dynamics of these older transnational macro regions. Now that was East Asia, where actually a lot of Chinese heritage survived in Japan, a lot of texts. That's why Japan is kind of an outsourced treasure house of a lot of Chinese texts. 
uh, and that somehow we should get used to the idea that yes, the analog survives earliest in Japan because they really cared about that, no? Um, then uh, two, three more topics here on what textual heritage could, uh, could kind of um, inspire a new literary historiography. I think really this boundary between canon and archive that the Asmans have talked about a lot. I think textual heritage can actually help us to uh, not so much look at canon canonical texts, but canonical practices. Now, I'll show you the example of actually writing Sinitic poetry in East Asia was a canonical practice. Now, if you did that, you could show cultural capital. Not all the poetry you produced was good. A lot of it was actually rather bad poetry. But I think, and that's something that literary scholars usually don't think of, no canonical practices rather than, you know, we, we're constructing that rather than a canon. I think also, and that's my abstract, so I'm not going to say so much about that, but it can really, textual heritage can help us uh, with the vertical integration of historiography, you know, from the object all the way to really big questions of intellectual history, cultural history, and so on. And the last point here is the return of ethos in Dior's historiography. With things like Black Lives Matter, or most recently Asian Lives Matter, you probably heard about the Atlanta shootings last week, uh, really po the post-colonial legacies we have to deal with are so central. And we have, um, we are in a moment now where really public history are also publics, the idea of how public discourses happen about things, nation branding happens, all of that uh, is really alive and very viral. And I think there, uh, textual heritage could uh, make a huge uh, contribution. And in the interest of time, I want to speed up a little bit here. I want to give you one example here that will lead me to the statement, history is not enough anymore. <laughs> this was the statement of the American Association, uh, a historical association also of historians, academic historians, on the Confederate monuments now that really symbolize slavery. And you probably heard all about that, what happened in the US. And the main point I want to make here is in the end here, where they said, you know what, you need to contextualize. Your statue has its own history. You can consult us historians about the history of your statue, and then you will actually decide whether it's so evil or not. And where I really felt like, oh my God, can that be it? All these statues symbolize slavery. How can it be that as historians, the only thing you can offer is to say, I'm going to date your statue and then you can better contextualize and you might actually decide not to do anything against it. But I just felt like there was so much constriction in the academic uh, kind of um, um, academic um, horizon really of history as a discipline. Uh, so I, I also look forward to hearing about, you know, history versus the history scholars versus heritage scholars, you know, in this debate. Um, now, very quickly about documentary versus textual heritage, and I'm not going to go over this. This is the definition of documentary heritage, very important here. Uh, this idea of danger of loss. Uh, it actually, the program was launched when the National Library in Sarajevo was destroyed by Serbian bombs in 1992. Um, and in that sense, the idea of the you know, cornerstone of democratic societies, bring, bringing people and cultures together was very important for that. Um, and the one thing, and you know what, I'm not going into this terminology now for the interest of time, the metaphorical, oh, very briefly, I think the one surplus of textual heritage here is that it looks much more at content, content and integrate things really into historiography, you know? And that's what I call here the metonymic, you know? As you say, crown for king, the crown is a part of the king. <laughs> and you just use that to express the king. Like a text is a part of that object, you have to look at it. And often in documentary heritage, especially in authorized heritage discourses, it's more like a metaphorical object that stands for peacemaking, for national identity, regional identity, global relevance. And in that sense, you know, it's not linked directly to all this academic history making to some degree, no? Um, now, uh, a few words on uh, now getting really to my example here of, um, of heritage. Very remarkable how many, <laughs> How, how well the Republic of Korea is doing and getting things registered with the program and getting central things like, you know, the, this is the manuscript with the Hangul script. No, uh, this is the first, Dikti is the first uh, book in the world ever printed with movable type. Uh, but of course, there are also other things related to uh, recent history. But my focus here is actually on the so-called documents on the Chulsan Tongshinsa. This is the Korean um, uh, pronunciation and Chulsan Tsushinchi, Japanese uh, pronunciation. 
uh, these missions between the 17th and 19th century of Koreans to Japan. Uh, and note here that the name under which this was registered is the history of peace building and cultural exchanges, very explicit about the purpose, not just the object, but the purpose. And here we have it. Um, uh, so these are these missions with a massive amount of people um, that produced a lot of actually poetry collections. And that's what I'm actually looking at at the moment. I have like stakes of these huge, you know, like hundreds of these, uh, these collections and really thousands, tens of thousands of these poems. This is the 4,500 kilometer path back and forth that these envoys were doing. We're taking uh, some great things about getting to know the other's music and instruments. Uh, these processions in Japan, you know, of these Korean envoys. Here you see a session of how they interacted. They couldn't speak each other's languages. But because Chinese is a logographic language, literary Chinese, they co communicated through so-called brush talk. You see that here, writing back and forth now and writing poetry to each other. And one thing that interests me so much here um, is actually um, this unique form of that poetry. So I have a project on envoy poetry that also looks at all kinds of other uh, you know, cultures. And it is very unique to have actually these tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of poems composed in a diplomatic context, you know, by all these envoys. And it's fantastic that the UNESCO, the Memory of the World Program, picked up on this and said, oh, there are these Chinese style poems. It's a unique form. No? They're writing with classical Chinese sentences and composed Chinese style poems. And this is really world historical, unique in the rock that we have. And no scholar has said that so far. <laughs> But you know, the UNESCO has said that and really emphasized the kind of uh, rarity. Now we have all kinds of, in, uh, of kind of reenactment um, events also based on this. Um, and here, what I really think is uh, that I want to point out, um, and you know, this is all about my research. I can say more if you're interested. This is the kind of poetry you have. They love to, left to, they love to write poetry to each other on fans, on beautiful objects, to grace each other with paintings, to write prefaces, to, ja to Japanese uh, kind of poetry collections. That was the best thing. Get a Korean envoy to write a preface to your poetry collection and you're going to be real hot. No, you're going to put that out and publish it. Uh, so uh, all kinds of literary contests happening now, uh, kind of people trying to outsmart each other and using really strange rhyme words. Um, um, and so on. So here, my, my kind of, and I'm getting now more towards the conclusion and really sorry to be so quick. If you have any questions, I would be glad to elaborate more on these materials. But what is my conclusion now uh, about, you know, looking at these um, poems, these end by poems really from a heritage angle, which is really thanks to this conference that I felt like, oh, wow, you know, I'm going to do this research differently, not just looking at the poetry and the cultural history. Um, this is what I would call really the need for trans-academic collaboration. This is not a word that's very much used. If I Googled it, I saw that, but I, I've come to like it uh, because I feel like things like public history, uh, if you get into UNESCO discourses, into kind of public institutions, that interaction, not just interdisciplinary interactions that used to be within universities, largely or think tank, but really going out there into society and all of the institutions we have in our complex society, that's what I call trans-academic collaboration, what I think was, is a great promise here and importance. So I feel really in the case of my particular, uh, these 333 documents uh, from the missions that became registered as uh, uh, heritage of the world. Yes, on the one hand, they emphasize official documents, you know, for example, the, the letters from the Korean kings, you know, uh, that were actually during the processions uh, uh, were actually shepherded under a separate palanquin. No? So important were these letters. It was a real diplomacy of literacy. You know? uh, so they are emphasized. There are also a lot of paintings. This goes a little bit with the monumenta approach, I think, with UNESCO. But there are some of those synodic poems, exactly the poems that I talked talk to you about when I talked about this poetry recitation that made it into that program, although they're not very much like, like necessary as kind of Chinese style heritage. No? So there is, of course, a kind of, an, of a bias from the contemporary perspective, but I really felt they got the big picture really very well. The world's significance, the comparative criteria, how rare these materials are, poetry and diplomacy, 
and where I really feel like we can learn from that no? And I think there are also constructive effects. They made this point that, oh my God, these reenactment events no? uh, can actually proceed based on all these diaries we have. These poetry collections, they, they often there's a little pros in between that say like, okay, uh, now we talked about medicine, now we talked about Confucian studies and here are a few poems again. These are real life records, almost like recordings no? of these sessions. So. In that sense, it is very interesting to bring all of that into reenactment events. And I tell you, I want to go to one of those and really look at what the role of poetry is, whether there is a role of poetry, because that was so important historically. And the question is whether it makes it into this reenactment uh, now. No? I also do think that any support we can get in terms of studying the past in this time of retrenchment for pre-modern humanities that plays out differently in different places that, you know, of people here, but that's a really good thing to have, no? Um, in that sense, I think too, those kind of players like UNESCO can be very helpful and very supportive uh, of our work. Um, and now from the literary and cultural historical angle that really inspired me to get into this project and then um, realizing like, oh my God, this is UNESCO World, you know, uh, uh, World Heritage and so on, is that I realized very much that the road these these um, envoys traveled, it's kind of a road of textual heritage <laughs> in the sense that they always went the same place. Often when they came back 10 years later, 20 years later, they said like, oh my God, I think I talked to your grandfather back in the day. <laughs> or is that and that person still alive? I want to meet the disciple of so-and-so. There is a real kind of road that um, where people build on what has happened before and where, as I understand it, and I understood that too by looking at the documents that are registered, this heritage, textual heritage, is really spread all over Japan, less so in Korea, but really a lot in Japan, because, and a lot of local institutions treasure that a lot, because they had a piece of these Koreans coming, bringing continental culture and cutting edge new knowledge and so on. So this is, I need to study this poetry as part of reimagining this road of textual heritage, you know, of this kind of constant reperformance of this mission diplomacy and these human encounters that we really see in these, these records now. Um, and here again, one thing that I think is so important, yes, why, so, so far a lot of the scholarship is just focused on single poetry collections and trying to date them and so on. So a lot, and you know, trying to actually put out a lot of that stuff in editions, modern editions. The Koreans have been great in even translating things into modern Korean and so on. Uh, but the problem there is that literary scholars just feel like, well, you know, it's very utilitarian poetry for that occasion. No, it's not good poetry. Although some of the writers here, the Korean, I mean, they usually both sides try to uh, have representatives of their state involved who were really good at writing you know Chinese poetry so in that sense we have some really good poetry too but I think it's very important here if you look from the perspective of textual heritage um, we, we really think about these also as canonical practices no high culture Sinitic literature composing that is an asset per se <laughs> whatever comes out no and we should study that also as literary historians and not just think of the Norton anthology of world literature I wouldn't put it in there since Eduardo mentioned that I'm the editor but culturally historically and even some you know is somehow uh, as a poetry of a very particular kind of social practice is incredibly interesting and fascinating. So I'm going to close now so that we have a little bit of time for uh, discussion. Really sorry uh, about this. How to do things with concept. I think in the broadest sense, I just talked about you know, specialized research, but all we, all, our shared concern is very much where's the past in our presentist age? No, that's why we're here, I think, today. And the main point here is that we have a highly diverse landscape of past making, history making, with very underdeveloped communication networks or networks that are just growing, as I said, with history and heritage studies, for example, even literary studies and heritage studies. But we all have a kind of a shared interest. And I talked about retrospective history making. That's more the academic creation of historiography. And prospective history making is the, in, the idea that with his, you know, with looking at history, we can learn for the future. That is more the UNESCO motivation, no, for creating dialogue and, and kind of modeling that, no. So there is a sense, I think. I mean, this is I'm putting that out. That's my sense. Has been my trajectory. History is not enough anymore. But in some ways, I think heritage is really strangely more Rankian than Ranke. 
there is something that's more objective. And uh, let me just make a metaphor here uh, or an analogy to translation. Uh, Google translation is literal, no? Word by word. That's why we don't understand it often. <laughs> what we seek in good translations, and especially in literary translation, is fidelity, not literalness, no? And the fidelity is the idea that there's something about the atmosphere, the content of that text, the import, cultural, cultural kind of importance of it that transports that into a translation. And I think heritage does that for us too, to some degree, fidelity, without the literalness of DNA, let's put it that way. Um, now, in terms of the potential of textual heritage, I'll just go over that. These are some of the points I made. Um, but so what is our task now? How can we find mutual inspiration for these kind of trans-academic collaborations? Uh, one thing I really like about heritage, and again here, I'm very newly moving into this field and watching it, it's a, it seems like a very actionable concept. Now, there are outcomes. You have to preserve texts. You have to care about their ownership. Now, you're not just talking about concepts and philosophy or you know, even like the con content of, of, of literature based on not looking at, at books. Also, it has a lot to do with community building, which is, I think, very, very crucial uh, nowadays, a community building around caring for the past. Now, um, so what could be productive synergies and also productive distances, you know, between established and emerging fields? I'm interested here in particular, documentary heritage, very established, you know, versus textual heritage. I talked a little bit about that in academia, perhaps literary studies now, and then literary heritage studies. <laughs> History of the book is already much more integrated, kind of. And then within heritage studies, what can textual heritage do as a concept really for that field now? I think we are in a magic moment now, no? where we are collectively really shaping the transformation of past or historical studies. This objectivity fetish is still of the 19th century. A lot of our institutions still work on the disciplinary model of the 19th century, very different. But I think even notions like pre-modern humanities that people use now, or they do hirings in pre-modern East Asian humanities, it leads to a methodological convergence between all these different disciplines and perhaps also some distances. But I think there's something very interesting about the reshuffling of disciplines right now. And we are part of that. And especially talking about the past is something we need to bring to that, to the humanities crisis and the transformation of the humanities in the 21st century. So overall, I think one very important goal is here to create a more level playing field between different players. Now that history as a that discipline isn't necessarily on top of memory studies or heritage studies or something uh, in that way. Um, and of course, also all the players around the world, you know, who contribute to studying that heritage. So creating more level playing fields and more sustained dialogues with all the kind of activists for the past. And uh, my apologies for using this term. I think all of us are somehow advocates or activists for the past that we care about and that we want to share our opinions about. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Deneke, for this really inspiring, perfectly uh, focused uh, keynote. I think Maybe we, we had a, um, a misunderstanding. You actually had a, a more five minutes uh, time, but so we, we can have more time. I, I think there are a lot of people with questions. And so if you want to write your question in the chat window, we may read it out. Or if you prefer to just turn on the mic and, and put a question or a comment, you can do it. Of course, I have already some. And now I let you the, the, allow you to share your screen if you prefer to the attendees. Of course, I, I have a series of questions for you, and but I don't want to monopolize the the the, the floor. So uh, while we are waiting for the first question, uh, I, I find maybe one of the most uh, strong point in your in your presentation is the the. The relation between history making and and uh, and, uh, and heritage making, and so that probably will come again out in, during uh, Professor Harvey's keynote tomorrow. Uh, that is also about the, the, how history becomes the, the, the telling of history becomes a, a form of heritage, and um, so I think to to break this wall between disciplines 
between what is if heritage studies is a discipline it's probably it's not so that's one of the the point that i am not an historian but if there is there are some historians between us i, I think they will be uh, shocked or touched by this and i, I see that roberta oh and indeed professor harvey say that uh, really like the, the phrase that history is not enough anymore, but has it ever been enough? What is it about the present moment that brings these things to the surface is the, the question from Professor Harvey. So maybe we can start from there. Shall I ask or? Yeah, oh, yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah, sorry, so, sorry. I, sorry, I, I started just... typing and then I thought, should I just put my hand up? But yeah. I, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, there's lots of lo lots of really lovely phrases. I, I'm hurriedly writing them down here. Also, really like the uh, the the uh, heritage is not theorizable, but heritageization is. That's really uh, yeah. There's lots. Of, oh, okay, yeah, that's really really love that. Um, but it's just uh, there's a there's a lot. Particularly, you're talking about thing people like the, uh, the American Historical Association not really coming up with the goods when it's really dealing with things like confederate statues and just not and, and your sort of realization at the moment well history isn't doing it history is not enough and i just think well is it there's something at the moment which is history is no longer enough or it or it never because you, know, you said any more or is it a case that it never has been enough or is it and we're just realizing this or is something going on at the moment which makes all these things uh which make which make, which has made a difference Mm. No, that's a great question. I, I think, I mean, overall, the model I try to propose is that we think of history um, and dealing with history now as a really wide field of a lot of different discourses that feed into that now. But I do think that history as a discipline has still a very strong purchase that people think like that is history. No, that's like the main thing that deals with the past. Uh, and even me as a literary historian, there are contexts where I have to say like, oh, I'm not a historian, but of course I am because I work historically. You know? And I think in that sense, uh, this, this fight between memory studies um, and history and memory studies coming up earlier than heritage studies for the historical part, I think, you no, know? uh, um, that is just a sign of history is kind of is a strong hegemonic place still. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't have that. I just think that we should think more broadly about historical culture and how to make sense of the past and let in a lot of, like into from a waiting room, let in a lot of players to contribute. So I'll just leave it there, but I look forward to more discussions about that. Thank you. And I see, I think Professor Stripoli Thank you very much. Yes, oh, yes but that's Stripoli. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So if you can turn on your mic and your camera, if you want. You can't. Oh, okay, sorry. That's because I have to to change the oh the string. Okay, eh, now 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 you can you can do it. I, yeah, sorry, I I mixed. I missed I am, up the permission. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, yes, thank you, Prof Professor Danike, for an incredibly rich a presentation. I think I would need to listen to it like multiple times to absorb like the <laughs> range of, uh, you know, topics and, and, and hints that, that you give us. It's, this is really, really um, uh, wonderful. I just, uh, um, of the many, many things that <laughs> one could ask about, I was particularly caught by um, when you mentioned uh, um, a democratic aspect of textual heritage, um, and then later on in your presentation, you mentioned again, like the idea of uh, leveling the field. Um, and I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a little more about this, because it really interests me and in my work. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for this question. And I might even draw in Professor Harvey because on some of these things, he might have much more to say. But if you look, if you kind of read through a lot of heritage scholarship, I do feel like, and I mean, that it's so often that I can't even quote, wouldn't even quote like particular people, but there's a sense of, and this goes back to Professor Harvey's question, 
as heritage studies as an alternative to dealing with the past somehow, no? And to bring in other voices, memory studies has a very strong sense. We bring in the voice of the people. We are listening to like not the heroes who made history and that kind of monumental historiography in the Nietzschean sense, but we are really listening to what people went through, no? So there is the idea of a grassroot uh, kind of um, bringing up of things more so in memory studies. Of course, in heritage studies, the problem is that then those discourses get shaped into authorized discourses and channeled through top down uh, yes. kind of dynamics. Yes. That's why I said there's kind of a kind of a, um, a, a paradox or tension there. The other point, though, is that uh, and I brought up, I didn't talk about it, something uh, called participatory archaeology. Uh, it's getting really big now. There's a lot of literature actually on Africa too, where really you empower people whose heritage you're studying there and excavating to be part of that. And, you know, not just as the diggers, but really as the people who, who, who kind of uh, get educated and, um, and can actually kind of participate in the discourses then about those objects. So I think that's, and that's then relating, related overall to kind of helping communities and to, Kind of work of NGOs and so on. There's a direct political connection too, but I think all of that hints at attempts to kind of um, bring much many more voices into uh, the making of historiography than you know political, diplomatic, military histories, which are the kind of hardest <laughs> core of historiography going back to the 19th century. You know, can bring. So I think that would be my short answer. But I would love to hear more about your work in that context, and we can we can connect later. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I, I think the, the problem of public is another big question. The public, I know there's a, a, a subfield of archaeology that is called public archaeology. So it's out to, 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 to let people just as to so then. Oh, you're yeah. cutting out, Eduardo. Oh, yeah. You, oh, sorry. You. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah. And so how to let people uh, democratically uh, join, take part in the, in the, in the process of the excavation and so on. So this, because it's, it's making sense, making, giving uh, value and meaning to, to the thing we, we find out. So how to read it, maybe if we want to bring back to, to, the, to the textual dimension. So how to read a text is a big problem. I, I know. There was a, a scandal some years ago with the uh, Indian classics that, that was who has the right to say how to read uh, Indian classics and, and, so, and so on. But maybe it's not the moment to, to talk about that. I, I see Heidi has a, a, a question. Maybe you want to, to just open your mic and yeah. ask it directly. Yes. Thank you very much for your great talk. And... Um, I was just thinking um, maybe um, as, as his, history studies and as well as memory studies, as well as heritage studies, I think they are lacking um, gender aspects. So we have a lot of debate now about gender language in the German, which, <laughs> but, and, and so um, I think, um, well, look for example at the UNESCO program, um, uh, Memory of the World how many works of women are there and so and and do they even um address this topic thank you wow thank you for this question i feel like i would have to launch into a second keynote <laughs> and actually before that think about we it. can talk about it <laughs> <laughs> before saying it but I mean, let me just say, so I, I do hear you on the uh, Memory of the World program, and I'm actually not in a position, if there's anybody here who's involved with that and can speak to that issue of how to actually try to bring forward, you know, more women authored uh, kind of um, items that, of course, where history twists, actually where history makes it difficult for us. Now, it's not just a question of the selection, but it's more a question of what was produced, now what women were able to produce and what was preserved. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's definitely, you know, a really interesting question that, that some people here might, might be able to um, answer. Uh, my one very obvious point <laughs> uh, would be to say, of course, that women to some degree figure in the category of leveling the playing field and bring in more voices. So in that sense, they are in this category, which I actually really don't like, but it's so easy to use it subaltern. No? So people who are, 
women, children, you know, disenfranchised, <laughs> underprivileged, a lot of those voices that we don't hear in historical sources. And we start to hear more and more studying the early modern period, I think, also in terms of the historical record. And that now we start to unearth more and more with precisely methods that are much more authentic to historical experience. That's what I meant by objectivity in historiography versus authenticity, you know, uh, of really being experiential about these people's life experiences now and so on. So that's just a very short answer, but it's a fantastic question and something where a lot needs to be done. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I think there are uh, two, two sides of so the, 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 the lack of uh, participation of women in the past, which uh, continues with our studies. And the other is even the women that were present in the past are not studied enough in the present. So these are two. Mm -hmm. two uh, yeah. Yes, that's, good. that's a good point. Yeah, very important. And then, of course, in academia, it's reproduced in terms of if you have few of women, you know, in academia, the kind of things they're going to select. So there's a, there's a whole chain reaction here of concatenation, concatenations, no, of uh, problem, problems. Yeah. So I see there. Thank you very much. I think there are no other questions at the moment. So I I just put one uh, my question. Um, if I I got it clear, maybe. One thing that we can, we, I mean, uh, we philologists, we scholars of literature may learn from heritage studies is uh, that, that this activism or this, this um, to work on the present have a, 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 how to say, more social oriented point of view, more maybe political. I don't know if this is one thing that you think we, on, on the side of, of scholars of the past, we need more. I don't know if it's your idea or if you can say something more about that. Mm. Yes, thank you. That's, of course, a broad topic that goes under the return of the ethos now in, in historiography and ethos in the humanities. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, people would say, like, what are the humanities for? Well, a skill set, no? critical thinking, all the skill sets we need for democ democratic societies. Now it has turned much more political. It's about diversity and inclusion very strongly in the US and I think in other places too where you know, I have uh, insight. Uh, diversity, inclusion, dealing with inequality, you know, <laughs> be that women, you know, be that people of color, uh, be that in, you know, kind of uh, supporting scholars working in under, you know, in academic environments that are very much struggling and so on. So, <clears throat> the, so in that sense, there's the ethos question. But you also probably refer to my last slide where I talked about past, the activists of the past. And I, I use this more metaphorically. Uh, in, I mean, for some people, it can be very activist. Uh, but I feel like we are all advocating for the past at the moment. And I think in academia, I think it would be good to get very uh, uh, genuine about it. Uh, think about all the positions that are disappearing in pre-modern studies, you know, in East Asia. And we always talk about like, oh, how can we kind of twist the rhetoric for the deans and, you know, might make this attractive. And it seems so disingenuous, like, okay, we have to craft a rhetoric to do that. Let's rather really embrace more fully the question like, how do we really make this fully attractive and also our research, no, not just when we write why a position shouldn't disappear. And I think in that sense, there is activism, not just political, but in act kind of, in, in, uh, kind of um, advocating for the past. And that might relate, of course, to political questions. No? Like in East Asia, yes. most directly, when you say there's a shared literary yeah. heritage, it's most directly about reconciliation in, a, in an area that's fraught with uh, political tensions and economic tensions. No? So it's more an effect. It's not like being the political. Okay. You're not just aiming at it from the first point. Well, but it's more like but, really thinking very carefully about like what can the past do for us now in our yeah. historical moment with all the challenges we are facing now, so. Thank you very much. So I see uh, Jeffrey Niedermeyer has um, a quite long question. Maybe you can turn up the mic and put it directly, Jeffrey, as we don't have other questions, so we can talk. We have more five minutes, you're perfectly in time. We can also read it out loud. It's oh, right. No, no, I can, I can, I can read it. If, do I have the permission? Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, hi. Thank you, thank you, Vipka, Professor Dinikas, for uh, such a, um, um, a, a stimulating and refreshing talk. I, I, my, um, my question was uh, maybe, maybe I wrote it better than I can express it in words, but uh, I, I'm wondering about the the tension that I'm perceiving, and I think you touched on this in 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 your words. Um, 
about the um, heritageization of um, cultural products that are representative versus those that are exceptional. Um, uh, you invoked kabuki and no as being upheld as kind of um, uh, emblems of the of Japanese national culture, and for that reason, they're getting uh, uh, you know turned into um, intangible heritage. While uh, while something like Semitic letters that are written among Korean and Japanese diplomats, um, uh, on the contrary, seem to be cherished for being singular or exceptional. And for me, I see uh, the there's at least a perception that these these two kinds of arguments for heritageization could be. Um, at odds. So I was wondering if uh, you could you could you could reflect on that. Yes, thank you so much uh, for this question, Jeffrey. This is wonderful and nice to hear from you. <laughs> to hear your voice. So, um, um, I, but let me let me just uh, uh, kind of clarify here what I meant about kabuki and no, as opposed to Sinaitic uh, poetry recitation. Um, is not so much uh, representative ex and exceptional, but more a process that um, with Kabuki, for example, in the early Meiji period in the late 19th century, you had uh, the beginning of censorship of Kabuki, trying to get rid of body elements of all kinds of, you know, un not so controlled <laughs> uh, sexual uh, political elements of Kabuki and actually getting people to write plays that actually kind of promote values of Westernization, high culture, moral education. No, um, and in that sense, those uh, kind of censorship and then you know edicts and then also a self-censoring uh, kind of attitudes by playwrights, especially at this kind of so-called Shinto Misa. No, they they really turn kabuki into a kind of tool of the state to both stand on par with Western theater or opera, which diplomats saw when they went abroad and which they were treated to so that they could also have kind of a national theater. And that also dealt with topics precisely of national education, moral education, no? So that, and that process of course, didn't help them for Sinitic in any way, you know? So I think it was not so much that it was representative, but it was like an early Meiji period, it was made into something that could be a good tool, no, for mass education to some degree. Although, I mean, in many ways, Sinitic poetry, and that, that this is kind of the, 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 the more problematic part about it in my experiences with it, um, especially like, um, you know, during the latter decades of the Japanese empire before 1945, some of this repertoire became very <laughs> militaristic, no? Um, and it's still in the repertoire now, no? And it was very interesting for me to sing along to some of these songs that really, are of that period now and of the great empire and imper, you know, uh, um, imperial intrusion in East Asia. So in that sense, it was also turned into something representative just a little bit later, I think, uh, in terms of the history. Um, but I think your general question about the representative and the exceptional is an excellent one. Um, and I think there, uh, it also relates a little bit to the question of documentary heritage, which I think is the most voraciously agnostic, <laughs> like everything that's a document <laughs> that's inscribed, it just qualifies, to textual heritage that we might want to associate perhaps yet more with real practices <laughs> or things that really were identity shaping to some degree. So parts of between canon and archive that are kind of more alive. Um, and then to things that are really canonized and enthroned as being the representative texts. No? And what I was suggesting there is that I think textual heritage gives us more of an idea of how practices can be canonical. And we shouldn't just be looking at texts <laughs> and products as we do as literary scholars, no? Uh, but I hope I didn't misunderstand you. I, I felt like your question was going into these two directions. Does that make sense or? Yes, yes. Uh, like part, part, of, part of what I was thinking was also just that when you're making an argument for something like the Chosen uh, Tsushinshi to these, um, you know, these diplomatic miss missives between um, Koreans and Japanese diplomats in um, written in uh, literary Chinese, it seems to be when you're making that kind of argument, whether it's to UNESCO or to some other body, it seems to be a very different kind of argumentation saying that this is an exceptional singular um, uh, body of texts as opposed to something that maybe um, is representative of a, of a monolithic national cultural heritage. And I wondered, um, maybe if that, uh, I, I guess I was thinking more about, you know, making that sort of um, 
that sort of pitch for heritization. If that, yeah, if that no, th helps to clarify. Yes, no, that's actually a great question. And I think I, I and we didn't go over this in detail, but I had it in the slides. The interesting thing is that that global pitch now, and that is very important, you know, things that actually you're very right, there's a tension in, you want to have something representative and then you, you make an argument about the uniqueness of this corpus. I, I understand very well now. Um, the interesting thing is that I think the, the, the global pitch now through UNESCO was very much, this is a model for how to make peace between nations which in the late 16th century <laughs> were at each other's throat. I mean, J Japan ravaging the Korean Peninsula, and then these missions ha happen after that to patch things up. And it's a, it's a great model for the world, how to make peace among, you know, in very difficult uh, circumstances. And uh, there, there's an explicit sentence in the nomination document that says, this is not particular for Japan and Korea. It should really stand as a model for the world. No? So this is actually interesting. And I'm very interested um, in, in this regard too, with how, um, with the fact that documentary heritage often can be much more transnational or international, because often it straddles different regions. <laughs> and in it that is. sense, yeah, uh, as yes, opposed uh, to monument to, to kind of tangible, which is in one place. And even if culturally it might be more multicultural, but it's in one place, it's one nation, very easy. Documentary gets really gets us into the ethos of history making because often it is all kinds of different, uh, you know, older macro regions, uh, or often also really um, states that, that you know, uh, or representative corpora, you know, of, of really not peacemaking, but, you know, great conflict, you know, like the Nanjing massacre documents, for yes, example, and stuff like that. Uh, the Holocaust, you know, for Germany, some Holocaust mm -hmm. uh, documents and so on. So in that sense, I think there's the double pitch of saying like, here we have something unique, but the overall pitch is really about kind of that peacemaking saying it's, it's not just about that. Um, it's just a very... Uh, it, it's just a record of documents that has a lot of integrity in terms of having a lot of really description and records about all of these events. So Thank I hope you. that's... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That Thank you so much. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I, I think many of the, the topics we are talking now will come again out in, in these three days for sure that the, the problem of canons, canonization on, and, and also the, the piece to use you know, something a, a little bit, maybe more important word peace. Um, and I think there are many, many contributors in this symposium that will touch this um, aspect. So uh, thank you again, Professor Deneke for this wonderful uh, talk. We, we just, well, are almost in time. So we will start our coffee break. I, I will do a, an, um, an applause, a virtual applause to, to <laughs> Professor Deneke for this wonderful talk. And, uh, if it's okay, I think we will start just on time. So I will share my screen with the with the with the program, and so you can see that we 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 should start at uh, one and a half one thirty with Professor Nelson presentation, and maybe we can take one or two minutes more. But I, I will start at thirty. Uh, so see you in uh, ten minutes. Thank you. We. we just turn off, just stay connected. Uh, we, we just turn off the, the, the mic uh, and the videos. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe we can, if, if Professor Nelson wants to start the, the screen share. Anyway, Andrea did the, 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 the floor when you, whenever you want. Yeah, shall we <clears throat> maybe wait a cup, just a couple more minutes to give uh, time for everyone to, to come back? And then, if, is, is that okay, Professor Nassim? Yes, um, can you see my screen? Yes, right now it's perfect. Right, very good, very good. So in a moment, I'll just uh, address everyone. <laughs> Very good. I'm going to go about two or three minutes over my time. Um, I don't want to read too quickly. Um, and my presentation, especially towards the end, is rather dense, uh, hard to understand. So I, it's going to go a little over time, not too much. I don't think. Of course, it's, it's completely up to you. And we have that time allotted for each presenter. So it's... 
Actually, I prepared thinking that it was 45 minutes. I, oh, did, I, the, I, I, did, I did the same thing as um, Weebka, but uh, yes, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have 45, so, but I'll manage. I'm sure it's going to be okay, yeah. Okay. Very different, I'm afraid, though. <laughs> Yeah, well, but, but the problem in interdisciplinary us. event is that you have to start from you know basics to to let everybody understand what you say. So, yeah, that's that's a problem, especially with music. I'm afraid. Yeah, <laughs> but I suppose the, this will leave more room for everyone to uh, to get interested and curious about the topic. I hope so. Um, yeah. <laughs> Eduardo, whenever you want. I, th I think it's okay, so the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope you had a pleasant, although short, break. Um, we are trying to provide all of us with some breaks in between. Um, and thank you again to Professor Lineke for her wonderful um, keynote. Um, we were just talking among the, the speakers and the presenters, and we have basically all of us had at least six, seven questions left for <laughs> Professor Deneke. So that's always a very good sign. Um, with these three presentations, we are basically uh, entering um, an area that is, I think, already speaks very clearly um, to the to our kind of approach. Um, today, we, we tried to um, organize the presentation slightly thematically, although we didn't really um, want to, to bind uh, anyone, certainly. But in any case, it, it seems from, from the program we, we put together, it seems that we were able to, to start with three presentations that really um, depart from from perhaps traditional approaches to things such as books and manuscripts. So in this sense, I think they will all make very clear um, how processes and practices um, are central, crucial to our, um, to our scholarly endeavors. And um, in this context, um, how, what kind of role texts play so without any further ado, I would like, it gives me a great pleasure, I would like to introduce uh, our first speaker, Professor Stephen Nelson. Uh, Professor Nelson was born in Australia um, and studied and worked in Japan since 1980. I think it's now a few, a few decades now. Um, he, after studying with, uh, with uh, Alan Marat at University of Sydney, he then uh, went on to Japan on a Japanese government scholarship and studied with incredibly revered and incredibly famous uh, ethnomusicologist Koizumi Fumio at the Tokyo National University of the Arts, where he completed both his MA and PhD coursework. Um, he's uh, been associated with the uh, Ueno Gakuen um, Research Archive for Japanese music under composer and historical musicologist Fukushima Kazuo. And he has produced a lot, of, um, uh, um, a lot of research in Japanese as well as in English, particularly on Japanese so-called court music, Japanese gagaku. But also I would like to mention his uh, important research um, on shomyo, uh, Japanese Buddhist chant. And he also served as the um, head of the Research Center for Japanese Traditional Music of Kyoto City University of the Arts. Then from 2004, he took up a professorship position in, at Hosei University. And this is basically his, his path. Um, within his many years of research in Japan, he has concentrated on Gagaku Shomyo, but also Heike Gatari, so the, the uh, narrative tradition connected to the Heike, to the tale of the Heike, and Jiuta Sokyoku as well. He also performs himself, or I don't know if uh, to what extent he would, he would say that he is uh, uh, publicly performing, but I did actually experience his performances more than once on the Koto 
um, and therefore he's uh, very much uh, working across historical research on the one hand and still um, particularly to do with reconstruction of uh, togaku, Japanese uh, music from uh, uh, Tang music. Um, so basically um, also applying his, his knowledge in a more practical sense. Um, I, I think I'm going to stop here. The, the title of his presentation is The Origins and Development of Tablature Notation for Japanese Tang Music. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I will begin. Um, Japan preserves many tablature scores for the ensemble music of uh, the Tang music or the Togaku repertoire, representing a written documentation of the music of Tang China and its performance tradition in Japan. There are part scores dating from before 1200 for several instruments, the four stringed lute biwa, the five stringed lute gogen, the, the transverse flute or teki, and the 13 stringed zither saw. These notations are tablatures which tell the player how to produce the de desired sound, most importantly, its pitch and rhythm. The written signs that indicate pitch, which I call primary tablature signs, indicate different things on each instrument, a combination of string and fret names for the lutes, fingerings for the flute, and string names for the zither. Even so, connections between the various sets of primary tablature signs reflect both their origins and the histories of the instruments. Perhaps the tongue music piece performed most often today is eten raku. This is the modern notation uh, for the three wind instruments. Notation for the transverse flute and reed pipe looks complex because in addition to the primary tablature signs, the notation also provides shoga, a mnemonic version of the melody used for singing and memorizing the part. The mouth organ um, notation is simpler since it gives only single, single tablature signs. These indicate the names of the aitake chords played by the instrument in current performance practice. The indication of the metrical structure of the piece and its repeating rhythmic cycles is very simple. To the right of uh, each column of notation, you can see a series of large and small dots. The large dots, called taiko byoshi, indicate the strong beat of the large drum in each cycle. The small dots, now called kobyoshi, indicate the head of each unit in the cycle. I will refer to these dots as extra columnar dots, since they are added outside to the right of the column of notation. In modern performance practice, each unit delineated by the extra columnar dot is interpreted as one measure made up of four, eight, or more rarely two or even three beats. In the case of etendaku, each extra columnar dot represents a measure of four beats. The strong stroke of the large drum comes at the head of the third measure in each cycle. In addition to uh, the extra columnar dots, there are dots or small hollow circles within the central column of notation. In this piece, dots of this kind appear as a rule at the end of even numbered units um, in the repeating cycles. They are especially regular in the mouth organ part. As well as indicating breathing spaces for the flute and the reed pipe, they also relate to musical phrasing. In this paper, I will refer to these dots as intracolumnar dots, since they occur within the column of notation. Before we turn to historical matters, let's take a quick look at the modern notation for the two string instruments, the lute biwa and the zither saw. These notations are simpler, showing primary tablature signs, string and fret names for the biwa and string names for the saw, with the extra, extra columnar dots indicating rhythmic units and cycles to the right. Note, please note that while the biwa notation includes the intracolumnar dots seen in the wind parts, these have disappeared from the saw notation. This seems only natural since breathing and phrasing are not really relevant in performance on the strings. Indeed, one might wonder why they are still there in the biwa part where they seem to have no function at all. Uh, the first aim of my presentation is to identify two lineages within the sets of primary tablature signs, one for four-stringed lute, mouth organ, and five-stringed lute, 
and the other four transverse flute, reed pipe, and the now extinct iron chimes. To begin with, however, I would like to introduce a text from 10th century Japan, which indicates that a grasp of the primary tablature signs of the instruments was regarded as an important part of contemporary cultural knowledge. Kuchizusami is a textbook for memorization compiled by Minamoto no Tamenori in 970 uh, for the son of a court noble. Its section on music begins with lists of the five tones and the correspondences between the modes and the various elements of the Chinese theory of the five phases. It then lists the primary tablature signs of six instruments, including those of the seven string zither. This is the oldest manuscript copy of Kuchizusami, and there are some problems with the text, but even so, it is very important since it, since it represents the oldest example of the primary tablature signs for some of the instruments whose notations do not survive from this early period. So to our first lineage for four string lute, mouth organ and five string lute. First, the four string lute or biwa. The biwa has four frets, uh, placed a distance of a tone, semitone, semitone, and semitone from the upper bridge. It has 20 primary tablature signs, one for each of the four strings and one for each of the 16 places where the strings cross the frets. The primary tablature signs do not indicate pitch directly. Since this instrument has multiple tunings, you have to know the tuning to read the pitch. The Kuchis of Sami uh, list, the, list the signs for the open strings first and then for each of the frets, beginning with the fourth fret. I won't go into detail here about variant versions of the tablature signs in Kuchis, in Kuchis of Sami, except to know that there is one character too many, which is uh, the one that I've circled. The oldest surviving example of notation for the biwa, by the way, is the tempio biwafu, a fragment of six, line, six lines of notation from the mid eighth century, the oldest notation surviving in Japan, Japanese notation. The mouth organ shawl has 17 bamboo pipes inserted into a wind chest. Two of the pipes, those blackened out in the diagram, do not have reeds, so make no sound. Kuchizusami lists the names of the pipes in clockwise order, and there is some variation in how their names are written. Substantial collections of notation for the shore do not survive from the ancient period. The earliest one is from the early 13th century. Luckily, however, there are 8th century examples of the instrument in the collection of the shore saw in that have the names of each pipe written on them. Um, the late Hayash Kenzo put together a chart of the tablature signs used on each instrument, which I quote here. Comparing these uh, with the modern tablature signs given below the chart, we see that the signs that I have marked differ substantially from their modern counterpoint counterparts. They are much closer to the forms taken by the tablature signs of the Biwa. It, ap it appears that during the Heian period, the 9th to the 12th centuries, an effort was made to distinguish the forms of the tablature signs of the two instruments without changing their readings. This is clear from the next chart where I have rearranged the pitches, the, the, the pipes in order of pitch. The shaw is a fixed pitch instrument and its pitch has not fluctuated much during its more than 1000 year history in Japan. If we allocate the same pitches, two octaves lower uh, to the biwa, we come up with a tentative basic tuning for the biwa of ascending fourths, B, E, A, D. What is remarkable, remarkable about this is that two instruments of such different nature, one a stringed instrument with multiple tunings and one a fixed pitched wind instrument should share the same tablature signs. We might ask which of the instruments this set of tablature signs, signs was originally created for. The answer lies in their origin. It was first suggested by the late Professor Cheng Ying Shu of Shanghai Conservatorium of Music that half of the signs for the lute are based on the Chinese numerals from one to 10. If we set out the tablature signs in the appropriate order to see the correspondence, we find that they are the signs for the open strings, the first fret, 
and the lower strings of the second fret, as shown in this chart. First, four of the signs take the form of the Chinese numerals as they stand, one, seven, eight, and 10. Next, three of the signs demonstrate a close similarity in form, but have unrelated pronunciations. The remaining three signs seem to have been replaced with signs with a related meaning. First, um, the numeral two has been replaced with the character pronounced otsu in Japanese, which means the second in a series, as in the expression ko otsu, the first two of the 10 heavenly stems of the Chinese calendar. Next, the numeral three has been replaced with a sign pronounced gyo in Japanese, which may derive from the radical known as sanzukuri. A character pronounced gyo, which uses this radical, is um, katachi, meaning form. Um, it may be a variant of uh, gyo nimben, uh, the left, left hand side of the character meaning to go, which can also be pronounced gyo. And finally, uh, the numeral four has been replaced with the character meaning up or upper which is suitable as the name for the highest pitched string, the top string. If this hypothesis is correct, it means that the Chinese numerals were first used for notation for the four stringed lute, since the order of the numerals makes no sense on the mouth organ in terms of either pitch or the arrangement of the pipes. So first applied to positions on the fret layout of the four string lute in a basic tuning, they were then transferred to the mouth organ. The primary, primary tablature signs of the four string lute are also used for the five string lute, gorgen. Since the latter has one more string, it uses several more tablature signs, which interestingly enough, include more Chinese numerals. These extra Chinese numerals are nine, which is next to eight of the fourth string, and four and five for positions on the fifth string that are stopped by the fourth and fifth fingers of the left hand. This tells us, of course, that the four string lute is older and that the notation for the five string lute was based on that of the older instrument. It seems clear that a certain amount of time must have elapsed after the adoption of Chinese numerals for the four string instru instrument, at least enough for the forms of the original Chinese numerals five and nine to have changed in its notation for them to be no longer regarded as numerals. If notation for the five string instrument appeared soon after its arrival in China, that is in the fifth or sixth century AD, then notation for the four string lute must have, have been developed some centuries before, perhaps even before Christ. Time flies and I must deal with my second lineage uh, of tablature signs a little more economically. There is a large body of notation uh, for the transverse flute used in Tang music, surviving from a, the score popularly known as Hakuga no Fuefu, or Hakuga's flute score of 966. This is contemporary with the list of tablature signs in Kichizasami, and the signs are there, therefore very similar. The primary tablature signs for the transverse flutes uh, indicate fingerings, not simply the names of the finger holes. There is a fingering called Ge, slightly different in lower and upper registers that involves covering only uh, covering one of the finger holes only partially. There are no substantial collections of notation for the reed pipe Chiriki from the ancient period. In those terms, the list of the primary tablature signs for this instrument in Kuchisasami is particularly valuable. At first glance, however, the order of the tablature signs in Kuchisasami appears random. It, it begins with a tablature sign in the middle of the range of the instrument, proceeds upwards, shifts to the lower register, and then continues in a random order. To cut a long story short, in an article I wrote in uh, 2013, I concluded that the tablature signs listed in Kuchizusami were not those of the Hichiriki used today, but those of a larger version of the instrument pitched a fourth lower, a longer instrument, uh, the Ohichiriki, which was performed in Japan until about the time that Kuchizusami was written. This larger instrument corresponds to the instrument described in Chinese sources, such as Chengyang's Yueshu of the, the early 12th century. 
If we reverse the order of the signs, we see that they largely match the signs given in, il in il an illustration of the instrument in Ueshu. Kuchizasami's list of tablature signs was for this larger version of the reed pipe. In the same article, I noted the close identity of these tablature signs with those of the Hokyo, a set of iron chimes with 16 tuned iron plates. This instrument was transmitted to Japan from Tang China by the 8th century, but its performance practice soon died out. In the late 11th century, however, trade with China brought the instrument to Japan again. A Chinese musician brought one to, with him to Japan in 1085, and during the succeeding century or so, it was played by both female and male musicians at the imperial court, many of whom were members of the family of hereditary head priests of Sumiyoshi Shrine, close to modern Osaka. This family appears to have been involved in maritime trade with uh, Sung China. This illustration is from Nenchu Gyoji Emaki, illustrated scroll, scrolls of the annual ceremonies. It depicts performance of a company dance at a court banquet that was held only twice in the 12th century, in 1158 and 1159. One of the three female musicians depicted here is playing the iron chimes. I might, might note in passing that the vertical flute shakuhachi, whose performance tradition had died out in the 10th century, was reconstructed for performance at this court banquet. One of the male musicians in the group behind the curtains is playing the shakuhachi. The tablature signs for the iron chimes are recorded in several medieval Japanese sources. They specify the pitches of each iron plate in a variety of, variety of ways. The chart on the right uh, adds the tablature signs of the mouth organ in red, while that on the left lists them um, along with the Japanese names of the 12 tones of the octave. Both methods provide us with specific pitches for each of the iron plates. All of this information can be put together into a chart showing their relationships. To summarize, a high degree of correspondence can be seen between the signs used in Chinese uh, gong che, uh, notation and those of the iron chimes as given in a Japanese record dated 1085. Many of the tablature signs can be traced back to those of the reed pipe and transverse flute, which takes us back at least to the mid 10th century as recorded in Hakuga's flute score and the tablature sign lists of Kuchizusami. It is interesting to note that in the case of the small reed pipe, the Japanese chiriki, the same si signs are used in the upper octave as are used in the lower octave of the large reed pipe. This implies that the tablature signs of the reed pipe could be used as an approximate indicator of absolute pitch. The reed pipe is small, a handy instrument to carry around, and its signs could have been used to notate the music of other instruments, or even of vocal music. I believe that this evidence strongly supports uh, the hypothesis that gong che notation originated in the wind instrument tablature signs of tongue music, especially those of the large reed pipe. Although this evidence survives primarily in Japanese sources, it tells us of an extremely important issue in Chinese music history, the origin of gongche notation. Going on to my next topic. When we examine the early scores for tongue music ensemble pieces, we are struck by how different they look from the modern scores, despite the fact that the primary, primary tablature signs have hardly undergone any change at all. The biggest difference is in the notation of rhythm and meter. The system of extra columnar dots, the ones on the right, um, is um, used in the modern scores, is not found in the early scores. So how do the early scores notate rhythm and meter without the system of extra column and dots? Instead of notating rhythm in terms of single units, shown by a dot, uh, that as the extra column system does, the early notations use a block made up of two units. Here I will adopt the term binary unit following the usage of binary as established by Professor Merritt more than 40 years ago. 
What we see in the early scores are various attempts to add notation of rhythm and meter to the primary tablature signs, limited and conditioned by an understanding of measured music that viewed the binary two unit as the fundamental element of temporal duration. Some of the early scores, especially those that were edited carefully as models for the performance tradition, include an explanation of their notational system, referred to as Ampuho. This is the Ampuho of Hakugan Mofuefu, Hakugan's flute score. A list of the primary tablature signs and an explanation of the fingering is followed by explanations of signs relating to rhythm, phrasing, and performance techniques. Similar ampuho can be found in other early scores, and I have collated each source's explanation for signs related to the notation of meter and rhythm in this table. The first sign, hyaku, is the Chinese character for 100, but appears to derive from the right-hand element of the character haku or hyo, uh, meaning beat. It is used widely in scores in place of the large dot in the extra column the system of modern tour documentation. The next signs, ka or fire and in or hiki or in uh, to pull can be viewed as a pair since they have the contrast, contrasting functions of shortening uh, and lengthening the duration of the tablature signs to which they apply. Note that Hakugano Fuefu uses the second sign in its semi-cursive form um, which resembles the, um, I'm sorry, which resembles the kata, kata, Japanese katakana ri. There, is an in, there are interesting variations in the, in the ways these signs are used in the early scores, but I don't have enough time to talk about that today. The remaining signs are the horizontal stroke and a Chinese, the Chinese character cho. Both definitions in Hakugano Fuefu uh, relate to interrupting the breath Professor Marit demonstrated in his 1977 article that the horizontal stroke acts not only as a phrase marker in the, in the column of notation, but also as a binary marker, a sign that divides the col column of notation into groups of two units or multiples of two units. If it occurs after a sign on the second, fourth, fifth, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, second, fourth, sixth, or eighth unit in a cycle, it functions only as a breath or a phrase marker. But if it occurs after a tablature sign on the first, third, fifth, or seventh unit in a cycle, it indicates that the tablature sign is to be elongated to fill out the binary unit. In this case, it functions in two ways, as a phrase marker and as a binary marker. The explanation of the second sign, cho, in Hakuna no Fuefu, adds that it is used in uh, kofu, or old uh, scores. Here I, I would like to examine its use as both a phrase marker and a binary marker in the oldest score for five-string lute, gogenfu. This is the first of four movements of a piece called seki seki en. This piece is constructed of eight cycles of eight units, giving a total of 64 units in all. The numbers enclosed in squares indicate the beginnings of, the, of each of the eight cycles. The basic rule of this notation is that one large tablature sign occupies one unit. The sign cho functions like the horizontal stroke in Hakuga's flute score, acting sometimes only as a phrase marker, but sometimes also as a binary marker. At the point marked A, the sign functions purely as a phrase marker at the end of metric cycle two. Next, at two points marked D, which are identical in content, the sign cho serves to elongate the previous tablature sign to fill up the binary unit, units five and six. And this is followed by a tick-like mark, which I interpret as indicating repetition of the pre preceding tablature sign, but with a reverse upward plucking action rather than a downward one. The temporal value of this mark is also doubled to fill up the bi final binary unit of this, the cycle, units seven and eight. The use of the sign cho as a phrase marker and a binary marker in the notation of gogen, gogenfu represents the least developed notation of rhythm to be found in the early Tang music sources in, surviving in Japan. 
in the following three to four centuries, Japanese musicians developed a highly consistent and systematic method for the notation of rhythm and meter. In my remaining time, I would like to use comparative examples of notation of the piece Manjuraku, music of 10,000 autumns, to illustrate two directions that this development took. As a preliminary step, Cho was abbreviated by removing the second stroke, leaving only the horizontal stroke. We don't know who made this innovation, but it certainly uses paper much more economically since the horizontal stroke takes up much less vertical space in the column of notation than Cho does. The next step in, in the process was to turn the horizontal stroke into an even more economical sign, a simple dot written into the column of notation, that is what I call the intracolumnar dot. To illustrate this development, I have prepared a comparative chart of the notation of a two cycle section from the piece Manjuraku, comparing five examples of notation from the mid 10th century uh, to the late 12th century. This comparison uh, includes both flute and lute tablature signs, and moreover, in the, in the case of Sango Yoroku, settings of the piece in two different tunings. So it is very diff diff difficult to compare them, but please trust me that the resulting melodies are basically the same uh, with differing, differing degrees of ornamentation. It is the binary markers, the horizontal stroke and the intracolumnar dot that are important here. And I believe that their positions can be found and compared quite easily. First, please compare columns one and three. The horizontal strokes of column one are fairly consistently replaced by intracolumnar dots in column three. In contrast, column two, the lute score in the hand of Minamoto no Tsune Nobu is quite inconsistent in its use of metrical signs, but where it does use them, it employs a horizontal stroke. It appears that lute notation in the late 11th century still employed the horizontal stroke, but flute notation by the early 12th century had adopted intracolumnar dots. Columns four and five are both examples from Fujiwara no Moronaga's Sango Yoroku. Moronaga's notation adopts the intracolumnar dot as binary marker and uses it extremely consistently. The horizontal stroke is also retained, however, to indicate melodic phrasing over a longer temporal range. You will find it at the very end in both examples. This section cycles three and four in the first movement of the Ha section of Manjuraku is hence recognized as a single long melodic phrase in Moronaga's notation. A recent discovery by one of my doctoral students, uh, Nemoto Chisato, adds support to the hypothesis that the horizontal stroke written to the right in the column of notation was transformed into a dot and taken into the center of the column. This is a rare example in a manuscript that has only recently been made, been made public of a transitional form, a dot acting as a binary marker written in the position of the horizontal stroke. Uh, at the moment, I know of no other example. This is the only surviving example of this transitional form. The next step of my argument, which is a little more difficult, um, I will postulate the reason for the appearance of the extra columnar dot notation. That is the type of rhythmic notation that is used in the modern scores. Okay. This is uh, the original notation for the first movement of the Ha of Manjuraku, as given in Motomasa no Fue, Motomasa Fue Fue. This is a scanned version of a black and white copy of a manuscript in which both black and red inks are used. I apologize for the fact that the difference between black and red is not clear, but I don't have access to the original manuscript and have not, don't have color photographs. What this score, flute score gives us is the primary tablature signs of the melody, along with two distinct ways of interpreting it rhythmically. First, you will find intracolumnar column dots, which are read in the original. These can be used to read the notation in binary units. This interpretation matches one set of taiko byoshi, 
indications of where the title is to be struck, written in black to the right of the column of notation. The second rhythmic in interpretation is supplied by the system of extra, extra columnar dots to the right, which are also read in the original. These, along with additional taiko byoshi in red, produce a rhythmic interpretation that is characterized by the consistent application of melodic syncopation. Now, I have written out the two rhythmic interpretations in parallel fashion um, in a comparative notation uh, that I will show you in just a moment. But before I do so, I would like you to note that at the very end of the annotation underneath the subtitle, ha, can be found the following. Shu wa gaku byoshi, sumi wa tada byoshi nari. Shu byoshi gaku nari. To translate literally, red is gaku byoshi, black is tada byoshi. The red hyoshi dots are for gaku byoshi. I understand this to mean that the black taiko byoshi are dots for the tada byoshi reading, that is the ordinary reading that uses the intra column, the column the dots as binary markers while the red taiko byoshi dots are for the gaku byoshi reading, the reading that uses, uses the extra columnary dots to produce a melodically syncopated version of the melody. Here are the two notations written out separately for cycles uh, five to eight. I believe that you will recognize in column two, uh, the, a consistent postponement of the primary tablature signs by the temporal duration of half a unit, sometimes more than that, with some exceptions, usually at the beginnings of musical phrases. The notation in Motomasa Huefu for the Gakubyoshi version is actually hard to decipher in many places. This may have something to do with the fact that this particular copy is a late copy. Unfortunately, no early copies survive. But it may also be because it is difficult to write both the Tadabyoshi version and the Gakubyoshi version with only the single column of primary tablature signs. What this reflects is not a simple change in notational style, like the one we saw in the shift from the horizontal stroke to the uh, intracolumnar dot, but a major innovation in terms of performance style with the development of the melodically synch syncopated performance version called Gakubyoshi. Now, by this, what I mean is a change like this. Da, 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 becoming da, 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 with syncopation after the beat. Ah, uh, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Yes, yes. Um, so this melodic style um, transcends the boundaries of the binary unit, binary unit musical language of the earlier scores. I can, at the moment, I can only speculate about how this sort of change occurred. The late 11th to early 12th century, century appears to have been a time when many experiments were, were um, attempted with, uh, with, with rhythmic and melodic variation performance, and this was one result. The development of the Gakubyoshi style of melodic syncopation seems to have brought with it a slowing in tempo. This is reflected in the parts for the stringed instruments in Gakubyoshi style, where many note repetitions, broken octaves, and other ornamental figures are added to the musical line to fill up the space. With wind instruments, it, it may have been enough just to extend the notes, but this will not work with plucked instruments. The melodic syncopation is not effective unless the syncopation is stressed by repeating the note at the beginning of the following unit. This is clear if we compare the ordinary version of uh, Manjuraku no Ha with the Gakubyoshi version in notation for the lute, uh, both of which are given in scroll 11 of the lute score Sango Yoroku. In Moronaga scores for strings, the ordinary version and the Gakubyoshi version are written out separately. Indeed, it would be impossible to write them together. It is easy to see the density of the ornamented Gakubyoshi version. What takes up only three columns of notation in the ordinary version takes up five columns in the ornamented version. If we write these out next to each other, I'm sorry, if we write these out next to each other, the melodic syncopation is clear. The red lines indicate places where the melody note from the previous unit is extended into the next. We can also note that the intracolumnary dots used to mark binary units in the ordinary version disappear 
in the Gakubyoshi version, since their function has been taken over completely by the extra columnar dots. Rhythm can be expressed fully with either one or the other. So in Moronaga's, Moronaga's scores, the two systems are not, never used together. Why they are used together in the modern lute part is a question whose answer may involve factors other than rhythm. So to my conclusion. Um, in the second half of this paper, I have traced developments, developments in the system for the notation of rhythm and meter in early Tang music scores that survive in Japan and demonstrated that the extra columnar dot system used today was devised as a, as a method for noting the gakubyoshi style of melodic ornamentation or syncopation in either the late 11th or early 12th century. As a result, the scores for strings of Fujiwara no Moronaga include two distinct ways of notating rhythm, both of which work consistently, systematically, and, a, and in a thoroughly prescriptive, prescri prescri I'm sorry, prescriptive way. Music notation is inherently conservative. It is fascinating to follow how the musicians who wrote these notations dealt with the existing norms of their music notation their textual heritage, so to speak, as changes in performance practice required them to develop new innovative met methods of writing down what they viewed as essential to performance of their music. Uh, thank you. I think I went a little over, over, to, over time. That's it, references. Don't worry, it's fine. Thank you very much, Professor Nelson. Um, indeed, this was a particularly good example, I think, of how detailed, sometimes maybe painstakingly detailed research into primary sources can lead to very exciting conclusions that have to do with the oral um, dimension of the notation. In other words, how, and perhaps actually I could, um, well, first of all, I would like to see if, if there are answers, if there are questions from the um, from uh, the participants or the attendees. You can, of course, put them in the chat or Eduardo can uh, unmute you if you would like to ask a question. Yes, I, I, I think you can. Yeah, everybody can unmute themselves. But... If, if you could, yes, if you could show the, the last year, last slide with the references again, I think that could be helpful for some of the participants. Thank you. Maybe since we don't have that much time uh, left for q and I could ask you, uh, sorry to impose on, on everyone else, but perhaps I could, have, I could ask you to elaborate a bit on, on that specific point of, of uh, how is it that historical research on textual sources can illuminate processes that are after all uh, embodied. Can you maybe talk about how this translates into um, potentially reconstruction of ancient sounds or ancient music? Um, this will lead me into a, a, a discussion of the um, tangible versus intangible problem. Um, Japanese togaku or gagaku as a whole is of course transmitted as a living performance practice. And uh, it is classed as an intangible, intangible cultural heritage of Japan, a very important one. Um, I, I, I study the old scores, so I'm always dealing with these tangible uh, examples and trying to uh, bridge the gap between them. Um, but I find I found as I've the more research I do, uh, the more I've discovered that an understanding of the intangible aspects, the modern performance practice is absolutely indispensable for, for looking at the old scores. You cannot look at the old scores and understand what they are trying to say without a knowledge of how the notation works nowadays. And this is where I have a lot of problems with much of the research on these early sources that is being undertaken by modern Chinese scholars. Uh, because they look at the sources, but they don't understand how the notation works in modern day performance practice. For instance, they don't have an understanding of how the extra column dots and the intra column dots worked historically, why one set appeared later than um, the other set. And so they often make very, let's say, ahistorical 
um, interpretations um, or interpre interpretations which um, actually um, deny the v validity of the Japanese Togaku uh, performance transmission. Uh, this is a great problem that we have to deal with in East Asia. And I'm always um, butting my head against it when I am, am in uh, communication with uh, Chinese scholars. So maybe I'm getting a little bit, I'm treading on toes here. So maybe I should say no more than that. Thank you so much. But, but indeed, one thing that I think a lot of us can relate um, from your answer is this um, sort of circular circularity of pers perspective from the from the present to the past as well, which very often gets ignored um, or because we get tunnel vision perhaps when we when we concentrate on the past, either or either on the past or on present uses of the past. But it's a very interesting perspective, the idea that it, these two uh, moments could be complementary to one another. Yes. Of course, um, music changes all the time. And that's another very, very uh, difficult uh, methodological problem for us musicologists, because we're dealing with something that shifts and changes shape um, continually throughout history. And uh, the methodology of dealing with changes in performance practice is something that um, hasn't really been dealt with properly. So uh, this is another aspect that is um, a slippery one for us musicologists, even perhaps even more slippery than uh, uh, textual heritage, <laughs> in a way. Indeed. How to use performance practice as historical evidence. Yeah. May I interrupt you? Sorry, Andrea, there is a question from Professor Harvey, but if you are, if it's okay for you, since the uh, Professor Nelson's presentation has many points in common from my point of view with the next speaker's presentation. Maybe we can uh, take again the, the, the questions at the next time. So we have also the, the coffee break and we, we can manage better without change too much the, the, the program. Sorry, Andrea. So no, it's fine. If, if Professor Avery what, wants to put it in the chat or to send it to one of us, to either of us in the chat, then perhaps we can, uh, we can incorporate it in the next Q&A. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Nelson. So, Thank you so much. Uh, let's, so if you can stop the, the, the screen sharing, we, I, I introduce uh, the next speaker, that is Gayatri Ayer. Uh, Gayatri Ayer is completing her PhD in temple sculpture with a focus on marginal figures known as ganyas. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it in the worst way. Anyway, uh, at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in, uh, or GNU in New Delhi, under the tutelage of Dr. Uh, Naman Ahuja. Uh, not only she is, is she a dance historian and a heart historian, but she herself is a uh, Bharata Natyam dancer. So I think we can say that we, we have both a scholar of heritage and a practitioner of heritage. I, I don't know if, if you agree. Um, so please correct me if I'm, I am wrong. Um, uh, Ayer's research is focused on the meeting point of movement and sculpture in Indian art with attention to architectonics, uh, poetics and placement. And her presentation today is titled From Text to Stone to Flesh, Intangible Translations in the Dancing Ganya of Shalukyan Art. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Eduardo, and uh, thank you to, to you and Andrea for putting together such a wonderful symposium. I've already learned so much and I already have so many questions, so I'm excited to get into it. Um, at the risk of overlapping with Professor Nelson, um, let me say that, you know, like him, I am also looking at an aspect of history, which is shape shifting, which changes shape, which changes form and therefore is very difficult to document by definition. Um, so we are essentially studying a field of documentation of the intangible, of the undocumentable as such. And that itself is a whole Pandora's box of problems. So we'll get into that a little bit later, but I, I wanna start by prefacing um, 
my presentation uh, by understanding the very nature of Indian art. And that is that Indian art by definition is interdisciplinary. Um, India has a very rich Sanskrit tradition, which is very much canonical to uh, draw on what uh, Professor Denicky said earlier in the keynote. Um, this, this notion of the canon is very well established in India. Um, and what I will be addressing today is both canonical in terms of the Sanskrit text that is being written, as well as canonical in terms of the form that is practiced. So classical dance is considered high art for all practical purposes. And so it's important to be aware of those things going into um, the study. Uh, so I uh, am I'm presenting a portion of my doctoral research, which uh, looks only at uh, one particular geographical region in India, although I am conducting a similar kind of study for other regions in India. So I just want to, I want to just kind of um, present my rationale for choosing this particular region because I feel that it's most demonstrative of some of the other things that are also happening in Indian art. So while I will be referencing a specific geographical uh, region and a specific dynasty, I do want us all to have the awareness that this does happen across the Indian subcontinent and that this notion of, of the interplay between text and stone and flesh is very real even today. So Come travel with me. Let's go to Badami, which is um, also known as Vatapi. It's the ancient capital of the Chalukya kings, um, situated in central Karnataka. Its location commands control over vast agricultural land, but it is itself surrounded by ragged, barren, rocky creeks and mountains that protect the city on all sides. The Malaprabha River provides plentiful fresh water and is known and it is known that boats would ply the riverine trade linking the Chalukyas to the ports and making the Chalukyan kingdom economically supreme in the 6th and 7th centuries. The seeming arid rocks, however, are but a sheath protecting the high ground water table. Ponds, a huge reservoir and even a spring are to be found near or at the temples. Um, whereas Badami has some of the most ancient temples, so there are temples that date back to 578 AD, uh, Aiholi and Patarakal, there are these two major cities nearby. They're also rich with temples made between the beginning of the 7th to the middle of the 8th century. Now, the reason that this chronology is important, as you will see, is because the text that we are looking at was dated earlier and all of the visual representations occur later on. So it's important to understand um, that the visuality of the text is an iteration, is an interpretation of that particular dynasty. So one of the most remarkable features of Ganas is that the largest majority is found in definite and consistent poses of music and dance. And so dance as such is used as an iconographic tool by the Chalukya dynasty. Um, to not just present their gods, but also to present multiple sort of characters in their temple space. And I, I often ask myself whether there is a larger sociological reason behind this. And one of my good friends at JNU is doing a PhD on how the community of sculptors actually lived in the same, um, the same portion of the village as the dancers, as the musicians, as the poets. And so one asks the question, were they all talking? Were they sharing interpretations of the text? We will never know, but it's an interesting thought. Um, and what I'm interested in, in the larger scheme of Chalukyan art, if you look at this panel in front of you, uh, is not the large and beautiful figures that are all in graceful postures of divine conquering, but I'm more interested in these little guys here, the, the, the figures in the margins. Now, these are the figures that are known as ganas. And ganas are generally speaking entourage figures. They're not uh, main figures and have largely been overlooked both in Indian art and worship as well as in Indian art history. Um, so I'm asking two major questions today. So why is dancing associated with ganas so consistently? And what is the syntax and vocabulary of dance iconography that's being used? Um, 
The fact that dance is used in sculpture is not surprising in itself, as several modern art historians have noted that dance forms a fundamental way of communicating meaning in Indian anthropomorphic imagery. In fact, the language of dance extends to the ganas that surround main deities at various temples as well. And adding implications of the meanings of dance poses to ganas allows a far deeper and richer reading of the iconography of individual sculptural panels and in turn to the entire iconographic program of the site. This paper initiates a close study of the consistency in the language of dance deployed by ganas across Chalukyan temples and of course the texts that this language is elucidated in. So let's start with, with the idea of the dancing gana, the idea of the gana and literature in general. Um, so there are many texts that discuss mythology, right? And so, so this body of text that discuss, discusses mythology in Indian art um, is largely known as Puranic literature. And there are mythological references to the function of the Gana in Puranic literature that define their, their iconographic inclusion in the cosmological space. So for example, the Vayu Purana acknowledges singing and dancing Ganas as their own category. So uh, there's a category called Vakra Pisasha. So Vakra means bent in Sanskrit. The category of Ganas that are bent, i.e. the category that is dancing. Um, even a cursory look uh, of, of the Puranic literature throws up very interesting examples. There's another example, for example, from the Linga Purana, um, which specifies that Ganas use musical instruments in the course of their worship. And if you look at this previous slide, you can see that there is a clear use of musical instruments here. Um, they use symbols, they use conches, they use different kinds of drums, they use flutes. During their worship, they sing in low, middle, and high pitches. They also jump, dance, and shout in joy. This is a, a, a quote from a verse in the Linga Purana. Um, furthermore, they uh, love vocal music and dance. They love the sound of instruments. And it is said in the texts that they know the essentials of the theory of vocal and instrumental music. Um, not only that, but at the sound of a lute, they dance at many places. So there's also a connection between music and dance, which is being established in these mythological texts. They apparently also play symbols by rubbing stone chips together and they accompany minstrels who are otherwise singing. So obviously the, the notion of performance is so integral to the definition of what a gana is um, that looking at it through the lens of performance becomes essential to understanding the identity of the figure itself. So let's understand a little bit uh, about the text that all of this music and dance is coming from. So one of the oldest texts of dramaturgy on the Indian subcontinent is a text known as the Nati Shastra. Um, the Nati Shastra dates roughly between the second century BC and the second century AD. Within the text, we observe that even in the narrative um, sort of order of the text, the character of the Gana is very important. So while it is a text of prescriptive codes, which are extremely strict, there is also this interplay between characters. So there is a character of Shiva that, that, that comes down to earth and says, okay, now I have taught you all how to dance. Now you will dance. And then the sages have a conversation with this character of Shiva. There's a dialogue, there's an interplay. And through that exchange of conversation, all these prescriptive codes are established. Now, what's interesting is even in that conversation, the Ganas have a role. They say, um, there's one verse, Tato Bhuta Gana Hrista. So the verse basically translates roughly to uh, Ganas see actions that are pleasing and familiar to them, and therefore they replicate those actions. And so this is also interesting because it throws up the notion of um, imitation and text and history and embodied heritage all within the same sort of category because you have this mythological figure who's not a mainstream figure, who is embodied and entrenched in this practice of dancing, 
but who's also very prominent in all of these textual sources. And so therefore becomes the ideal body through which to communicate the prescriptive codes of the Nadi Shastra. Um, so, you know, the fourth chapter of the text is where all the dance happens, the fourth chapter of the Nadi Shastra. And the amount of codification in this text is incredible. So there are shirobedas, there are movements of the head, there are movements of the neck, there are movements of the major limbs, the minor limbs, there are movements uh, of the eyebrows, of the nose, of the upper lip, of the lower lip. So the, the level of categorization is insane. And the way in which uh, these movements are then strung together to create movement sequences, which become part of these layered movement systems um, is something that's unique to the Nati Shastra uh, in terms of the way it sets up the dancing body. Um, and so I just want to sort of demonstrate this quickly. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel more comfortable doing this because Professor Nelson sang during his presentation. So I feel it's all right for me to do this. Um, so just to demonstrate, I'll, I'll demonstrate a few of the head movements which are prescribed in the Nati Shastra. So there's Samam, which is the even straight looking head. Udvahitam, Adomukam, Alolitam, and then it goes on and on and on. So you get the sense of the nature of codification. And so when we look at movement patterns in the Nati Shastra, it's important for us to understand what is the logic behind defining the moving body. When you are transcribing movement from flesh to text, um, it, it becomes difficult. So just imagine if you had to write a movement sequence down hand it to a friend who's never seen the movement that you're talking about and have that friend replicate movements only from your writing, there's bound to be something that goes wrong, right? Which is why these codes always are kind of general and vague definitions of movement and can never be um, pinpointed as, uh, as singular or as universal in that sense. But that's where the notion of sculpture comes in because it gives us a, a visual cue at least of one moment in the movement sequence that we can look at and say, oh, okay. So if, if this portion of the movement looks like this, then perhaps I can replicate it like this. Um, so there are two kinds of main movement uh, sequences that are mentioned in the Nati Shastra. One, involves both feet on the ground, which are bumi charis, so bumi meaning earth, so both feet are on the ground. And the second movement type is the akashiki charis, where one foot is raised and one foot is on the ground. And these movements form the basis of a movement sequence known as a karana. Now in the fourth chapter of the Nati Shastra, there are 108 such karanas that are mentioned. And in Indian sculpture, we have numerous sites that depict uh, one or all of these karanas in different, uh, like kind of frozen at different moments in time. Um, so this chapter is uh, like an extremely uh, controversial chapter, I would say in the Nati Shastra because a lot of dance historians and art historians have looked at it and all of them have different opinions on what the correct interpretation of the text is supposed to be. So let's talk a little bit about what a karana is. So as I said earlier, a karana is a, a, a string of movements, but it says in the Nati Shastra so clearly, hastapada samyoga nrittasya karanam bhavet. What unites the movement of the hand and the feet uh, is a karana. So there's, so that's the movement of the hand and the foot happens simultaneously is what he's trying to say. So the question of the karana is complex. On one hand, the embodied practice of karanas exists in very few situations. Perhaps today um, in the practice of uh, the dance form of Kuchipudi, um, but uh, there has been a resurgence in understanding and excavating karana practice in current dance forms, but there is not a lived tradition of surviving karana practice, if that makes sense. 
On the other hand, Karana, on the other hand, Karanas survive in their earlier forms only as moments frozen in stone, making the job of the dancer and the art historian tenuous at best. From the dancer's point of view, frozen images must be strung together to create one seamless movement, where the art historian grapples with why Karanas have been frozen as at those specific moments in time. Was that the sculptor's choice? And are there more important implications of this type of art? This conversation between flesh and stone has opened up a new field of dance archeology span and dance history. Although our concern is the examination of karanas as units of movement and meaning that aid the ganas in their iconographic definition. But identifying karanas is also a challenge because if a movement is frozen at a moment in time, how are you very sure that that exact moment in time corresponds directly with, with a singular portion of one of the what, 108 karanas that are mentioned in the text. So it becomes um, a very technical study, but luckily the musculature of these sculptures is so detailed that it becomes easier for us to then go back and reference the text. So the question here is, what is the archive? What is the canon that exists for us? Now, the reason why Chalukyan art is interesting is because Chalukyan art does not have a archive or a canon which is labeled. So there aren't Karana sculptures with names and postures underneath them. And that's possibly because the sculptures date between the fifth and eighth centuries AD. And it's possible that at this time, karanas were in vogue, they were in practice, they were in embodied practice, they were possibly part of temple traditions, they were part of court traditions, and therefore there was no need to actually archive them in this regimented sort of way. Whereas when you hit the, hit the 10th century, really, you start seeing you know, these archives, these labeled archives of karana sculpture. And they become a catalog of sorts where all of the postures are identifiable in the same sequence that they're mentioned in the Natya Shastra. This one is from the, the Brihadishwara temple in Tanjavur um, that dates to the 10th century AD. And this one is a more famous one. This one is uh, found at Chidambaram and this, this gateway dates to the 13th century AD. And you can't see it in this image, but there are actually written labels under each of these postures that correspond directly with the postures, the, the name of the posture in the text. And so the question is how, why is it that there is suddenly this shift towards documenting these postures in this extremely regimented, almost school teacher like way, right? I mean, if I was to teach karanas to my dance students, I would encourage them to look at a diagram like this because it, it's all sequential. Um, but in Chalukyan art, it's not at all sequential. Uh, so I did some more digging and what I came across is that the earliest fully cataloged documentation of karanas in stone is found in Prambanan in Indonesia. Uh, it's actually not in India. And uh, it, this uh, catalog dates to the ninth century. So it's about a uh, hundred years, 150 years before uh, this catalog, which is the earliest one that survives in India. And so then the argument is perhaps it's a diasporic uh, impulse to want to catalog things that you don't understand. And that culture then through trade with the Chola empire came to Tamil Nadu and started flourishing here, this, this idea of the catalog. So that still brings us back to a very difficult um, question, which is what is the text image relationship in Chalukya art? So Chalukya art is before Prambanan, before Tanjavur, before Chidambaram, no catalogs exist, only the text exists and the sculpture exists. And so that's why I want to posit this entire paper as a sixth century reading of the text, because the way in which movement is interpreted in stone in the sixth century, it isn't later on. And we'll get to that in a second. 
So in order to understand Karna sculptures more thoroughly, one must draw upon the work of Dr. Kapila Vatsa and Dr. Padma Subramaniam and Dr. Alexandra Lopez Iroyo. Um, but unfortunately, due to the limited amount of scholarship on dance postures specifically utilized in sculpture, one must rely on these sources as the most authoritative. And these methodologies are largely rooted in performance and reconstruction. While Dr. Vatsyayan possesses a more historical perspective, Dr. Lopez Iroyo and Dr. Subramaniam employ a more dance-based embodied perspective. Now, the reason why dance-based perspectives are dangerous is because uh, as dancers, as, as those of us who are trained dancers, I believe we already have movement bias in our body. We are trained for so many years in a certain way. So when you look at a text and try to reconstruct something, there is no guarantee that your own movement bias then will not influence the way in which you read the text. And uh, this is going back to what uh, Professor Nelson said, documenting the undocumentable. <laughs> so by elucidating how sculptural vocabulary is used by the dancer, the plastic arts are not only a lens through which we can see and understand the documentation that has been left for us, but more importantly, the consummate skill with which the Indian sculptor has modeled the dancing figure over a period of nearly seven, 800 years. Uh, and, and this is kind of one of the, the interesting and enduring qualities of this text of the Nati Shastra is that it does have a 6th century interpretation, an 8th century interpretation, a 10th century interpretation, a 13th century interpretation, etc. So you have also different versions of the text that are being written in stone, if that makes sense. Um, so let's look at a few examples that I have brought. So hopefully the examples will make um, my argument clearer. So there is a posture in the Natya Shastra called the Garuda Plutakam. So the posture is used to signify a bird's flight or the notion of flying in general. Uh, Garuda is the name of the mythological eagle mount of the Hindu god Vishnu. And in the text, Garuda Plutakam is described as a posture with a backward extension of the foot and a specific set of hand gestures. So the hand gestures mentioned are Lata and Rechito. So these are two specific gestures mentioned in the text. And so there's a number of ways to interpret the backward extension of the foot. And this figure right here is most consistent with the definition of Garuda Plutakam. And what's interesting is we know possibly that the sculptor knows the Nati Shastra because he has added a beak. Now I'm open to someone criticizing me and telling me that that's not a beak. We can, we can discuss this later, <laughs> but I do believe that there is a beak there because of the very obvious sort of lifting of the leg. Now the leg, the lifted leg, the bent leg is synecdocal of a bird's wing in Indian sculpture. This is not the first example in which this happens. And this sculpture has a particularly dramatic rare bent leg with the left hand extending backward, which is a characteristic of this karana. The figure also demonstrates a position of the right hand that is not commonly seen in dance sculptures. It's, it's actually uh, being covered by the head of this other sculpture. But my guess is that it would be this uh, gesture right here. And this gesture is used normally to symbolize the beak um, of the figure. So I find that this, this zoomorphic use of iconography to evoke the labeling in the text is something that tells us so strongly that there is this connection between text and art and image and the way the sculptor is presenting his thoughts. Um, let's look at another example, which is possibly more convincing than this one. So there's a posture that's mentioned where um, the leg is lifted in fear of a snake. So the figure who's dancing sees a snake, gets scared, and lifts his leg in the opposite direction. And uh, the, the label, again, the name of the karana, Bujanga Trasita, has the word snake in it, uh, which makes for a very interesting iconographic play for the uh, art historian. So let's take a look at a few examples. So here you see a hooded snake and you see a lifted leg. 
And here is another karana, which is mentioned sequentially right after Bhujangatrasita and shows the lifted knee. This karana is called Urdhvajanu. Uh, Urdhvajanu literally means lifted knee. So they're also, they come right next to each other. So there's also uh, possibly an understanding of sequence in the text. Again, you have the snake and you have the lifted leg in the opposite direction. This is at Aihole. This is at Mahakota where you have the snake and the lifted leg. This is at Badami again. You have the snake here and the lifted leg in the opposite direction. And this is again, a posture with a lifted leg. And you can't see it. This figure is holding the snake over his head, but you can see the hood right here. So there is a connection. There is a very strong connection between um, text and uh, stone. And it's true even in a, a situation that isn't so direct. So all of the figures you saw until now were actually holding the snake in their hands. But in this case, you have this large figure that's seated on a snake. This is a Vaikuntha Vishnu. And in the panel that's opposite, him, you have this figure who's lifting a leg. Now I know this angle is a bit strange, so you can't see it as clearly as the other ones. So you imagine that the Vaikuntha Vishnu would be to his right, to this figure's right. Sorry. So there's also this notion of seeing this larger than life snake and still being afraid of it and still assuming this posture. So it's interesting how the sculptor works in these tiny changes to the iconographic program based on these larger than life images as well. Um, the next uh, posture I wanna talk about is very interesting because unlike a lot of the other postures in the Natya Shastra, it doesn't have an extensive explanation of where the hands are supposed to be and where the feet are supposed to be. It's just called Vrishikam or Vrishika Rechitam. And Vrishika in Sanskrit is the word for scorpion. So all that they tell us is that the feet are supposed to be held like a scorpion. So we don't know what that means. But if you look here, we have a foot with a scorpion's tail uh, I know this is a bit of a stretch, but this has been re this has been identified also based on later uh, Im interpretations and images of the text. And what I find interesting, I'm, I hope you can see it in this image, is there's a gana here with a lifted leg and a lifted hand in the posture of a scorpion. And right next to him, there's this figure with pincers, with these sort of claws which means that the sculptor must have understood for sure that, that, that there is a posture that had to do with the scorpion. I mean, it, it, he wouldn't randomly put a pair of pincers there, I hope. Uh, um, this is another angle where you can see the pincers a bit more closely. And that referencing, that direct referencing of the nomenclature in the text gives me a lot of hope that there actually was a thorough reading of these dramaturgical texts by the sculptor or at least by the designer, right? By the person who is laying out the sculpture. And similarly, you have another scorpion-like figure here. Now, this is the last uh, a karna that I'm going to talk about today. And this one is very important because with the inclusion of this karna, I'm going to try and understand how we move it again from flesh, from stone back to flesh. Um, now, the karna apavida, now each of these karanas in the text uh, has been notated and has the commentary of uh, Abhinava Gupta, who is a later commentator, he uh, writes his commentary um, later on defining the emotional purpose of each of these postures. 
So in the text, Apavidam is one of the postures that is used to emote jealousy and anger. And it is placed in the cave where you see this goddess killing this buffalo demon. So it's fair to assume that there's some amount of anger in this sculpture. And sure enough, right underneath this sculpture is a posture that appears to be the practice of Apavidam. Now, how we know this is because the text tells us that one of the main features of the Karana is the backwards turning of this hand right here, which is supposed to be in a mudra called Shukatunda, which is this. So this backwards turning and resting of the top part of the wrist on the hip is supposed to be an essential component of this particular Karana sculpture. Now, in this uh, interpretation of it, you see that the Gana is in a half-seated posture of the lower limbs. Both knees are bent, one set of toes is lifted, and one set of toes, one, one heel is lifted and one heel is flat. And there is a clear half-seated posture of the lower limbs. As lo uh, along with this hand that's supposed to be at the heart. Um, now I'm going to show you a dancer, Dr. Padma Subramaniam, who's actually reconstructed this karana through practice based on later catalog uh, uh, sculptures. <laughs> we, we can say, we can see the, the, the video, sorry, Gayatri. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Is it visible? Maybe you can, you should stop the the the, the sharing a, a little and then start it again with the with the video. Sure. So I'll stop share and then restart with. Yes. The... Maybe maybe it's the see it here. Wait. <laughs> hmm. It doesn't doesn't works. Yeah, I think it's working. Okay, here we go. Can you see it? No, no. Maybe you should share the 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 the, the video player before okay, from share. Zoom, so you click on the share screen and and select the the, the window of your video player. Maybe we we should before we. It worked before <laughs> it worked during before the, yeah, on the test. And anyway, if some, somebody has some question to put it in the in the in the chat so we can uh, oh yes if you have it. okay okay now it works maybe okay. yeah I'll just get it to okay the... Okay, so this is Dr. Padma Subramaniam, who's... Now, why this reconstruction is so important is because you're looking at the posture which she executed when she put the wrist on her hip if you remember, she was still standing. She was not seated. And she turned her hip and sat afterwards. And so that reconstruction is based on the sculptures that she's reading from the 10th to the 13th centuries. Whereas in this case, you have the wrist turned when the lower posture of the limbs is seated. And so basically the point I'm trying to make here is that even in the most diligent reconstructions, there are elements which are um, vague and uh, sort of fuzzy. And the problem with reading text is that, as I said earlier, there's about 10 different interpretations. So I would like to conclude um, not with a tangible conclusion uh, or any sort of a, a neat understanding of this extremely messy field of text and flesh and stone, but by asking a few questions. One would be, what is the text? My body is also the text. 
uh, the musculature that I use to create posture is also the text. Uh, and can I use that text then to find a credible meeting point between what is written, what is sculpted and what is danced? And what is then a responsible way to move forward with, with the notion and the endeavor of dance construction? Um, is it something we should be attempting at all? Because there's so much gray area in the text and so much gray area in the sculpture. Or is it something that we should all attempt and say that, oh, okay, there's this person's way of doing it and this person's way of doing it and this person's way of doing it. Um, and lastly, you know, what is the, the function of the body in perpetuating tradition? And this kind of goes back to what Professor Denicky was saying earlier is that, you know, the immortalization of a tradition or the notion of the canon canonization as such um, is premised on the fact that the te text is a catalyst for history making. Um, but what really creates a canon? What immortalizes something in script or in stone? And in this case, I ask the question, is it the body that does that labor for us? Uh, so with that, I open the floor to questions. And I hope I was okay with time. I think I was. Well, okay. Thank you very much, Gayatri. Actually, yeah, we, we went a little bit long, but it was uh, our fault to, to not manage the time better. Uh, I, I just put a word here. I, I find that your presentation and Professor Nelson's one were um, around the, the concept of embodiments from my point of view, for, for what we, we think about textual heritage. So the text is an embodiment of music and the, the performance is the embodiment of text. So I, I find this is really two perfect examples of what I, I think, I don't understand anything about music and dance, but it's really a, a so inspiring example of what textual, textual heritage may mean. So um, now we have the questions. I, I would like to start in time the last uh, presentation of uh, um, Colonel Bass, Professor Bass, because it's, it's, it's late, late already. So if there are any questions uh, about uh, Gayatri Ayer's presentation, please raise your hand or open your mic. Um, okay. And, there is the, 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 the geographical question also from Professor Harvey. I don't know if it's the same. Anyway, uh, Professor Harvey uh, raised the hand before. So only a quick one is uh, I'll ask yeah. the geography question. Some other, I, I, to me, the, both these papers work extremely well together. And there's this geographical story in here as well as a sort of uh, temporal story. You're locating it in time. But for both of you, there's a sort of there sounds like there's a geographical story behind all this in terms of between India and Indonesia or between Japan and China, but the other one I'd, I'd really strikes me with both of these papers working together is just how your practice informs your scholarship. For both of you, it seems really, you've got a lot of investment in both. I'm just thinking how you can, how one informs the other. It's fascinating to watch. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, I, it was a question, right? How do, how, how do your, I mean, maybe Gayatri, your, your practice as dancer may inform your your practice as scholar. Maybe it was the, the question, I, I guess. A anyway, it's, it's, it's something I, I was going to ask you. So how do you merge the two? I think, um, yeah, it's you're walking a tight rope. Uh, it, it's dangerous because on one hand, I mean, I've been trained in Bhartanatyam since I was four years old. So I'm talking about an embodied practice, which, uh, which is in my body well before I decided to become an art historian or a dance historian. So um, as I was saying earlier, there is the risk of movement bias, right? There's a risk of looking at a sculpture and saying, hey, I can assume that posture right away, rather than really sitting with the text and saying, no, let me break it down into the most minutest of movement codes that have been prescribed and see if I can actually work ground up rather than from my movement bias down. So I agree it really helps, but it, it's, a, it's a dangerous uh, sort of tightrope to be walking as well, so. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's on this. I think here there is also another big question in heritage studies that is authenticity. And that also Professor Denike 
talk a little bit about before, because which one is more authentic? Is the living heritage, the, the embodied uh, dance or the text? And it's something that probably also about uh, Buddhism and Buddhist um, uh, classical writings and the practice of or religious practice is uh, in, on, the, on the plate. I, I know Professor Abe Ryuichi from uh, Harvard talked about this, but anyway, that's another story. And I don't know if Professor Nelson wants to add something about this, the process of embodiment from text, from, sorry, from music. So from something, per, from a performance to a text and again to a new creation of performance, there is something, my question may be, where is the creativity in these processes? That the heritage process is a creative process or is just uh, something you have to protect the authenticity of of this heritage. Sorry for that. Um, that's a, a very difficult question. Um, we, when we're dealing with gagaku, um, we have this uh, myth of gagaku never having changed since uh, more than a thousand years ago, and that that was that story was. Um, spread especially strongly, um, let's say, in the last 150 years when um, Gagaku became a symbol of the, uh, the Shinto religion and the imperial house. And so they have this wonderful narrative of this music uh, being transported from China and then never changing. But uh, when you go back and look at the sources, you see just how much it must, it, it must have changed. Um, for me, um, it's been a very difficult process, but um, I, I, I feel that I had to learn to play many of the instruments before I uh, could manage to look at the, um, the, older, the older texts and see what they were actually trying to write. Um, what um, what were the what the important things were for the mus musicians to write down? Um, of course, at that you know at the time when the Jap the Japanese musicians went to China, they went there to study. Most of them uh, were there uh, there for only um, a few months, or not even a year in most cases. Um, it, it, perhaps even at the longest time, maybe a year and a half or so, they had this very short period of time to absorb something that was very important in China that they needed to bring back to Japan. And um, of course, they, they, they had no way of, they didn't have recorders and they didn't have videos and things. You know. They had to do things um, in a very um, immediate sort of way. So um, music notation, um, I'm not sure about dance notation in, in East Asia. I think that's another problem. But uh, for music notation was for them a very, very important tool. And they uh, worked out how to use it in their own way and they improved on it um, once they got back to, uh, to Japan. Um, the geography is very important. Sorry, I, I won't say any no. more than that, yeah. except that uh, um, the, the reestablishment of trade with China in the 11th century um, is another thing that we need to think about more. Um, the distance is always, was always very great, uh, but there, were, there was a lot of unofficial uh, contact going on between the cultures at, uh, at this time too. Um, and um, I think we need to have a little bit no more knowledge about that sort of thing too, to understand what was happening. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's really a big, um, issue and I think we really need like 10 minutes of break to oxygen our brains and maybe if there are any other questions we, we can kind of integrate them or after or tomorrow probably we have a little bit more time so let's go for with the coffee break and see you uh, exactly on time uh, at 3 and 15 for the last presentation of today thank you for the moment And here we are. Okay, hi, hello again, everybody. Um, let's start in time with the, uh, the last, the last presentation of this first day. That is built full of input and and interesting presentation. I stopped my my sharing, so I I ask next speaker to, to start the, the, 
screen sharing. And so I go on with the presentation. <clears throat> uh, the, our last uh, speaker today is Vanessa Paloma Duncan Elbas. Uh, is a Marie Curie Fellow at INALCO, Université Sorbonne Paris Cité, uh, on the ERC funded project Encoding Absor Absorption and Abandonment of Cultural Material During Migration, the case of Judeo Spanish uh, songbooks. Uh, Dr. Elbas is also a research associate at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Music, where she is currently based, I think. And her research is focused on issues of gender, language, power, and the positionality of Jewish voices in the building of nations and nationalisms in the trans Gibraltarian, uh, Gibraltar region. She is preparing a book titled Jewish Northern Morocco Sings, popular music and its transformation into a minority group's communal core. And she is also an international performing artist of Moroccan Jewish uh, repertoire. So again, we have a scholar that is also a performer that is really uh, interesting. Um, and maybe this is a characteristic of many of our participants today. Also, Andrea actually is a kind of performance, I know, but I don't know if you want to talk about that. So. Um, Dr. Elba's presentation today is titled Cancioneros, North African Judeo-Spanish Songbooks uh, from 90, uh, 1761 to, to today, 2021. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. I had a little moment with my PowerPoint was all in the wrong place. You so have started screen. Sharing. Your screen okay. sharing is paused. You and are screen sharing. I don't know okay. how to turn that off. Thank you. Okay, but, but thank you. For, like, <laughs> you know? <was> talking to <laughs> me. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, great. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's uh, really exciting to hear all these uh, different perspectives and theorizations and and musical sides of things. Um, and sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Your screen sharing is paused. You are screen sharing. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Okay, we can also okay. hear the strange voice, but yeah, I don't know how to. <laughs> you know what? We're not going to waste time with that. So, um, good afternoon. I am thrilled to have my first visit to Venice and to Cafoscari University for this symposium on exploring the potential of a new analytic category in textual heritage. Um, most of my research focuses on Judeo-Spanish oral literatures, and one of the recurring issues in the scholarship of this material has been the very philological heavy focus of previous work and the historical use of scholarship to the search of variants um, of some kind of original urtext, right? Uh, in order to establish a Spanish cultural hegemony over diasporic variants. So this is the reason, oh, I'm having technical all sorts of things. Okay, so this is the reason that the symposium where we're gathered to discover what the role that literature, historical chronicles, musical scores, inscriptions, manuscripts, books, sculptures, and scrolls play in the process of creation of heritage and in the negotiation of cultural identities, both in the past as well as today, um, which appears as a central concern of the analysis that has concerned me increasingly in recent years. So my work has found that the variants themselves tell the most interesting story of change of displacement, transformation, adaptation, and absorption of new cultural material as part of the sonic trace of the movement of a community through time and space. Through the manners in which these writers, singers, poets of Judeo-Spanish songbooks interacted with their traditional textual and musical repertoires, notated, erased, and transmitted it, I propose that we can understand a human migratory textual methodology of transformation and transmission. As the symposium abstract reads the issues of authenticity, authorship, ownership, and this 
relationship that us musicians are very much involved with between the tangible and the intangible heritage charge in the process of reading, writing, copying, translating, and performing these texts, which in my case exists in layers throughout the multilingual, multi-temporal, multi-spatial elements that the writers, performers, and guardians of these texts inhabit. So I wish to discuss this issue with you today, focusing on notated songs the Judeo-Spanish community of the Mediterranean basin wants to remember or transmit in personal songbooks. These songbooks, which are most exclusive, almost all of them are textual and have no musical notation to the great frustration of you know, musicians if we have lost the melodies, um, were created for both personal use and to, for the transmission to their descendants. And as I'll show later, it appears to me and I'm in the process of analyzing this further, that the notators of these objects of orality, which is what I call them, um, have different objectives, motives, and relationships to these songbooks during their inception, during the writing process, and also in their afterlife. So I'd like to, believe, to begin by tracing the movement of this community since the expulsion of 1492, as this was that catalyst for a new paradigm of existence and of relationship to each other, to language, to song. Isabel Lavelle has left the meeting. <laughs> Maya Ninitz has joined the meeting. And of course, how to manage transmission in a critical moment of loss and transformation. Um, the community that I will speak about today established itself in seven cities in, in the Northern region of Morocco. As early- Mahesh as Sharma has joined the meeting as early as early as the late 14th century with uh, the Gerush Svilia, which is the exile from Seville, prompted after the fourth, forced conversions of 1391, and as late as the 17th century, when the crypto Jews fleeing inquisitorial Spain and Portugal continued trickling into North Africa. So theirs is a story of movement and of continuous movement, which included the Amazon and Argentina in the 19th century, and as we will see today, Cairo and Paris in the 20th century, as well as Montreal, Ashdod, Madrid, and many others. So this paper today is just the beginning of a longer project, which traces Western and Eastern Mediterranean songbooks written by both men and women. And I do address this gender difference because um, as I find there is actually a difference in their own relationship to the, to the creation interaction with and the guardianship of these texts. Um, and they're actually written in various languages. They're multilingual. They're in Judeo-Spanish. They're in Spanish. Sometimes they're in English, Italian, French. They're in Aljamiado, which is a Spanish and Hebrew script mm -hmm. to try to establish, if possible, oh. universal patterns of repertoire or textual absorption encoding and abandonment of cultural material during their migration. So today I'm focusing exclusively on the Moroccan Judeo-Spanish songbooks. And the first one that I'll discuss was written by a young adolescent in 1761 in Gibraltar in London. And the last one that I'll show is by an older man in Tangier in Paris. However, the ghost of the songbooks to be is always with me. There is a songbook that's actually currently being written in Casablanca by a 90 year old woman. And I hope to be able to include that one. But the interesting process about that one is that I'm able to see the process of the songbook actually being written and not just perceiving it as a completed text and then garnering information from that. The Jews of Northern Morocco established their own sort of Judeo-Spanish, which combines medieval Spanish, Hebrew, and Moroccan Arabic, which is called Haketia. This uh, volume of um, Hebrew and Arabic inflection are contingent on their audience and the effect desired from the communication. This comes clearly through in the songbooks, as most of the notated oral materials are almost completely cleansed of local linguistic particularities, and they transform into what Spanish philologists have considered a manner of demonstrating Hispanic 
the Hispanic nature of their contributions to Spanish intellectual history. However, I think that it's very important to understand that actually the notators were, because they thought in some cases they were notating Spanish material, so they would clean, clean out as they do in their spoken language um, when they're speaking to somebody that only understands Spanish, they'll actually speak almost completely with the Haketia, the Arabic and the Hebrew erased out. Only very, it appears in only very um, pointed and specific spots. In 1912, the Spanish protectorate was established in Northern Morocco and um, it lasted until 1956. And these Haketia speaking Jews became one of the factors that were used by the military and the political powers in demonstration of a colonial right to the land. Their fluency in Haketia, which sounded to the Spanish military and political um, powers as uh, an ancient version, version of Spanish, um, meant that the Jewish community became by default a bureaucratic and cultural middleman between the Moroccan masses and the colonial infrastructure. This was not lost on cultural programmers to colonial theaters and soon songs from Sarsuelas and others began showing up in songbooks because they were hearing them in the theater and then as young people were writing them down to be able to keep them and, and, and repeat this popular culture that was coming into their, their country from the peninsula. Um, this, for me, it demonstrates the interweaving of the local, the colonial, the religious, the secular, which all appear side by side in these compilations of orality. When I look at the variety of material in these songbooks, there is a sense of atomization in the information, of a smattering of all the sonic materials that might have come through their ears. It has, of course, posed great difficulty to scholars to present the totality of these books and their materials in any way that is satisfying. Usually they appear as a list of elements, linear and disjointed, similar to the manner in which the list of their diasporic arrival points was on the previous slide or two slides ago. But I want to propose today that instead of a linear approach caught up in both linear temporalities and spatial paradigms, that we approach units of textual and sonic differentiation as connected and moving. The image in front of us right now is the Edict of Expulsion um, of the Jews that was signed by Ferdinand and Isabella, the Catholic monarchs at the Alhambra on March 30th, 1492. And this linear text caused a multiplicity of atomized and exploded realities and movements. In its calm and organized inhumanity, this seemingly calm text caused a social disorganization that continues to have repercussions until today. I would like to propose to you all today a different visual paradigm for studying these texts of migrations, and that is a portolan navigation. Editor Bessie has joined the meeting. A portolan navigational chart. This one here. A mate has joined the meeting. This one here presented is held at the Wren Library at Trinity College in Cambridge from the end of the 16th century and thought to have been penned by a Spanish scribe in Italy which brings me to these precise atomizations that can form part of our paradigm of textual and sonic stasis and movement and the manners in which we interact with this dynamic of motion on text on a page. What struck me about these charts when I started to look at them in the context of a visual symbol for my current project on manuscripts that move are the lines. It's these lines, these lines crisscrossing across the spatial constructs of geographies, languages, and nations that actually show the urgency of movement that can get lost if we maintain paradigms of text in columnar organization, such as the Edict of Expulsion. So we have these two sorts of visual impetus, the edict written by monarchs claiming a grounded belonging to a specific geographical placement and claiming territorial and intellectual ownership of the land, ideas and beliefs that stirred in the hearts of their subjects. Parallel to this heavy document trying to create a homogenous stasis, we have the navigational charts, which is all about movement and arrival. 
The rosettas that pepper the parchment throughout the coastlines and land masses seem to propel the voyager along a new line of impetus. There are also points where multiple lines cross against each other, creating new seeming points of convergence, which are at times in the middle of nowhere, posing the question to the viewer if they mean anything at all or nothing at all. So I would like to take these two types of documents as metaphors for the sort of manner in which we can approach textual heritageization. Either we can work in columns and try to find a canonic homogeny of belonging, community, place, and ownership, which to me frankly seems like we've missed the point, or we can engage dynamically in these crisscrossing lines, points of arrival that are departures and seeming innocuous non-centers of convergence. How can we look at these texts in a dynamic, decentered manner that is grounded in the texts and sounds that accompany them while methodologically giving a voice to the creators and holders of these traditions? As uh, Bernard Cerculini stated in L'Eloge de la Variante, uh, the praise to the variant in 1989, that of course with printing, then the text was raised to a quasi sacred status and interestingly mentioned that a history of printed textual corrections would be fascinating. However, in my case, I'm looking at handwritten personal objects of orality, which in some cases have whole pages scratched out, lines written over, as well as variations in handwriting, direction, colors of ink, and in some cases, even a notation about the specific date and place of composition. They have what Cerculini calls l'alterité manuscrit, the alterity of manuscript, which goes again to my visual metaphor of expulsion and homogeneity and Portolan chart and diversity. Is the work of the manuscript then to break with the idea of homogeneity of thought, production, and reception? Since the 18th century, these Judeo-Spanish men and women throughout the Mediterranean basin have notated these songs that they want to transmit in personal songbooks. These songbooks were created for their own use and also for transmission to their descendants. They trace local, temporal, and mental spaces of heritageization. But the porousness of repertoire that I find in these private books, which function as these objects of orality, demonstrate this continued absorption and interpenetration of language and cultural references during various centuries of this community's heritage building. Songbooks served as cultural reminders of the layered identities that Judeo-Spanish speakers sought to preserve. While keeping traditional repertoire, the writers of these songbooks simultaneously absorbed important elements from their surroundings, demonstrating a multiplicity of cultural codes that coexist dynamically. This construction of their seemingly opposing roles as preservers and innovators of repertoire breaks at all attempts of strict regionalism while ensuring that certain traditional specificities remain untouched and unchanged. So here I- Maya has left the meeting. Maya Ninitz has joined the meeting. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have a, um, so I have some examples that I want to go through. Um, this first one is of course the, the earliest one. It's written by Abraham Israel, who was actually from Northern Morocco, a family from Tetuan, and it's held at the National Library. So another thing that's interesting for me is some of these manuscripts are actually in libraries and in archives and others are still held by the family. And so what does that tell us about the, the relationship and, and the lived life of this dynamic of these texts themselves and the songs that they carry? So this manuscript by Abraham Israel, who lived- Roger Macy to everyone. The host should be able to silence the intrusive <laughs> messages. So, I tried, but it's something probably connected no, to. I, it's my fault yeah. somewhere. So let's go. I don't know why. Yeah, my computer actually shut down and then restarted and then did this funny thing. Probably so. something. Yeah, let's um, blame Zoom. It's Zoom is the the bad guy. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, in any case, um, so the thing that I think is interesting is this man. He actually started writing this book, this notebook, in Gibraltar, um, and. 
in his notebook, he talks about, it's mostly songs in, in Spanish, actually, in peninsular Spanish. It has many seguidillas and coplas. And, um, and so it's been edited and published as a demonstration of the 18th century Spanish literary culture which I think is interesting because there are a series of songs in English. There are five songs in English in there um, because he lived in Gibraltar. And during that time, he traveled to London to go look for a bride um, and then traveled back to Gibraltar. So actually even some of the pieces are while he was on the boat. Um, so we have this movement happening. And then some of the pieces are actually um, Judeo-Spanish songs that are written sideways um, in that same book with a different ink. So maybe many years later. And we know that when he wrote it, he was young. He was unmarried. He was, uh, I think, between 17 and 20. So what happened to this book that ended up going to the National Library of Spain today? It is not held by the family. Somebody let go of it, right, in the process. It did not fulfill this moment of transmission or was it that this was just the book of this adolescent young man who was writing down the songs that he liked and he wasn't really writing it for any sort of transmission function, right? Um, this is uh, one of the, the songs inside. We have two songs actually here. We have um, to the left, uh, La Cantiga de Jacob, right, which is, so these are two of the Judeo-Spanish ones that are talking about uh, biblical narratives. And then we have another one on the right, Moses subió a los shamaim. And so this one has a word in Hebrew, Moses went up to heavens without food or drink. Um, and, and this one, Moses subió a los, a los shamaim, is actually a song that is still sung today. Um, for a specific holiday, for the holiday of Shavuot, of the giving of the Torah. So, um, so Abraham Israel is engaging with his, with his lived ritual tradition through this song. We even have a, a line that's scratched out, right? Those, those are the best for me because then I know, you know what he was thinking. Um, but then we have this other songbook um, that comes a hundred years later, also in Gibraltar by a man from Tetuan as well, that um, went from Tetuan to Gibraltar and ended up going to Cairo and establishing himself in Cairo. He also wrote this book when he was very young. Um, and at the very beginning, um, he has a poem that he wrote in the first person where he's talking about leaving Gibraltar. So it seems that it's actually not a song. But then after that, we have songs from Cuba, uh, Habanera, we have Seguidillas, we have a song in Arabic, we have um, songs in French, we have La Marseillaise. So we start to, to hear the, the, the drums of colonialism in, in the text, starting to perform in the text. And um, the example that I've put here uh, is, is just a song about you know daily life and this is most most of the songs that he has are about love and a couple about god and religion but it's really this very it seems like a very personal songbook that he of the songs that he as a young man wrote for himself because he wanted to be able to remember the text or maybe he copied it out of a different manuscript and he wanted to be able to sing them again um but now we move to another example by a, a woman called Azibuena Barujel. And this one is also actually um, in a library. This one is at the National Library of Israel. And it's a manuscript that she actually wrote out. And we can see here, the text very clearly says, it's a recuerdo para sus hijas, Miriam Esther y Flora Barujel y Rachel Barujel. So she's writing this in the memory, or for, as, a, as a memory of herself. So she's like, placing herself into this text for her daughters so that her daughters can carry these songs with them into the next generation. And, and this is so far as it appears to me to be 
the main difference between these texts, these songbooks, these objects of orality that I'm finding from the, the men and from the women. The women are very often writing them at the end of their lives. And the men are very often writing them at the beginning of their lives. So there's a different temporality, even in the, in the putting them down and, and in, in their own personal function of what they do with it. I, I don't have an example of this, but I have another very early um, manuscript from 1913 from the coast of Morocco, which is also a young woman. But interestingly enough, she became blind during after she was married. And so her daughter let me put, she still owns the manuscript. She let me photograph it, but it was almost like this poignant reminder of the fact that their mother wasn't always blind. So, so we have these uh, functionalities of these texts that, that transmit not only song and text, but also emotion and memory of the person itself and of the transmission and of this intellectual heritage of orality, not of textual. Well, intellectual textual orality heritage. <laughs> How do we put all these things together? But it's, it's really, it's the intangible that they're passing down. And this is what I'm trying to understand how do how do we measure that? How we how do we heritageize the intangible that is actually at the core of what these of what these songbooks stand for? So this is um, one of the the songs that is still also in the oral tradition and that is um, sung very much. And if one day you want to take a look, I actually have a video of myself performing this when I was nine months pregnant. And it's a song about uh, a man that, that has impregnated a hundred women, a, a monk, right? So, so we have all these uh, layers of, of information that's jokes and, and spirituality and, uh, and lived moments that are being transmitted through these texts because these are all songs that are, that represent the, the lived moment. So I have a couple of examples at the end here that are, uh, that have musical notation, but they are very rare. And this one is actually also in an archive, um, very interesting, uh, written by Jose Benoliel, who was a philologist living in Lisbon at the time, but he was actually the first one that in 1922 started writing about Hakatia and eventually wrote the only really book that exists about it. But here he's notated not the songs in Judeo-Spanish, but the songs in Hebrew. So um, he's written out the melody of the liturgical songs, um, and interesting to, to understand why these choices, because he has also in his book, he has songs in Hakatia in Judeo-Spanish. So it's possibly that this gendered aspect that the songs in Hakatia were only written down by foreign musicologists that came, that wrote them down because they were usually actually melodic contrafacta, right? So they're, they're um, their melodies that were known and that, that, that were part of the common parlay of the community. So there was no need to actually write the music. Um, people, you just said, you know, it's this one and everybody knew the melody. They said, do you sing it in this melody or in that one? So it's, it's, it's in the cultural dictionary of the community itself. Um, and then this last example that I want to show is uh, of a man called Mesod Muyal who, um, very interesting because he had this this idea of bringing together the the jazz and the salsa music of his own cultural desire to the traditional music of northern morocco of of the synagogue music and this is obviously and here we have this multilingual 
piece. We have uh, some French at the top, right? We have the Judeo-Spanish on the side. We have the Hebrew to the left, and then we have the musical aspect in the center, which I think also tells us something about the way, why is the text not under the music? Why is it not underlaid? There's some kind of a way of this separation of, of melody, text, language, um, perceived embodied connection to it. So I see that I'm, um, our time is, is up, but so this, this is um, really what my question is for us, is how do we then, when we have elements that all seem to connect to one sort of community or diaspora or connection or linguistic or heritage, religious identity, but have such disparate elements to them, and and variations in them. So text the 21 has left the meeting. What is what is the manner that we can actually use it? So I'm very interested in and there's somebody that's talking about um, the digital aspects of this on the last day, I think it is very interested in that because I think that that is our answer. I, I think that maybe to be able to actually really have all these layers intermingling and my minutes to everyone. Excuse me, I have to leave. Each presentation was very interesting. Thank you very much. I love this. This is part of what is about our, our intertextuality. We're having a live performance art to intertextuality <laughs> during my talk. So I'll leave it at that. My um, has left the meeting. And I will mute myself so that you don't have to hear all that. Um, and then um, I'll leave it at that. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. This was a fascinating presentation. And yes, well, of course, we'll uh, express uh, as we wish <laughs> our gratitude. I wonder if I can kick off the discussion. In the meantime, if, if anyone wants to pose any questions um, in the chat, that's fine. Um, or just you can raise your hand and go ahead and unmute yourselves if you want. Maybe I can just start by um, basically continuing on where you left off, possibly. Um, how do we record this kind of diasporic spreading of text, sounds, memories, with different lived experiences, different embodiments of, of, of these songs? Um, I wonder. If you, you know, the famous ethnomusicologist Stephen Feld, right, he coined this, this term acoustemology, join, conjoining uh, um, acoustics and, and epistemology. So I was wondering if you thought of, of this as in terms of, of diasporic acoustic epistemology in a way. Um, obviously, the way he answers is, is, is by recording, right? So, so using field recordings as a way to make the point through sound rather than through texts. Um, I was wondering, have you thought of alternative practices of, you know, alternative to writing to convey this kind of diasporic acoustic epistemology? Yes, thank you, because that actually um, allows me to, to talk about this uh, Basically, when I, I, I moved to Morocco in 2007 as a Fulbright scholar, and I started recording the Jewish community. And I then stayed there for 11 years and have and recorded thousands of hours. And so part my next project really is um, a large sound archive. I have started this archive. I started organizing all this material. And part of the idea is that the archive, the sonic archive has to go with this textual archive and has to go with the audiovisual archive and has to go with also the, the, the scholarly archive that has commented on this material because we're all in, in relationship to each other. Um, so the issue is though how, how to really do that in a way that that works um, that works in the long run and for the long term. 
And actually, we're actually the right before we started our meeting at eleven. I had a, a meeting. Well, at eleven here in Cambridge, I had a meeting with uh, um, with somebody at ten at ten because we're doing a, a pilot for it with some recordings that I have uh, in Judeo Arabic, actually, of women's songs that have not been written down, um, but that. Chautin, uh, the musicologist, the French colonial musicologist wrote down in 1924 um, for the Muslim community, but that these are Jewish songs for um, that women sing during birth, during all the different moments of birth. And so we're actually doing a platform, a pilot platform, which will be the, the platform for the largest one. And interestingly enough, the reason I'm bringing up all this detail is because the 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 person who's um, the company that's that's doing this uh, after I put up all the material on the Google Drive and they were all looking at it and the people that build it and that are visual and that are you know doing all these other things they said well you know maybe it actually shouldn't be the recordings that you did at the center of the platform but maybe we should start with something visual and maybe it has to interact and you know how do we make this so we're actually in the process of trying to build this acoustic explanation of this larger um lived embodied experience because it's really it's an embodied life totality so only like when we only take the songbook obviously from 1771 you know we, we only have that um we have maybe like imprints and remnants of of that in today but um but from the material that's you know from the 20th and 21st centuries we we have so much more so we can try to to do that so yes that's that's part of that's, the way that that I'm trying to approach that yeah that's wonderful so I think definitely a lot of us look look at the digital possibilities or the affordances of of digital um, media to create a more multivocal, possibly multimedia, but also multivocal output for our research. So this is a very exciting example of that. I think it, it is the connection between texts and what's around texts. It, it depends on what you're focusing on, but for, for a scholar of literature, is what's around literature, how the text is performed, etc. And so today we have new new tools to archive things. So there are a lot of very central issues in, in this research. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for, for no more next time. Sorry, Andrea. No, no, no worries, obviously. Actually, I would like to open the floor up as much as possible <laughs> instead of just monopolizing it. So if you have questions, please. To say sorry about um, making a bad situation worse by putting that message to the host. I, you know, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. I, I think it's actually a really good example of this intertextuality. You know, it's like we 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 have this lived constantly. We ha we have all these. So how how do we? manage that intertextuality that the sonic aspect i mean i'm a performer right at base that's where i started as a performer and it was after 20 years of performing that i said uh, you know the i have to write about this in a way that people will understand because without if you're only writing about it then you've lost you know 80 percent of what's happening so um so it's i think it's this um this lived, constant, moving, sonic, visual, intertextuality. It's, it's how do we maintain that suppleness and at the same time have the, the, the deep scholarly grounding? I mean, also how, how do we have time for, to really do it all well, right? And one thing that I'll, I think came up from, from all of today's um, contributions is also how difficult it is to grapple with elements that are so hard to translate into one form or things that once stay put movement in terms of bodily movement and then movement in terms of uh, diasporic 
fluxes and sort of movements of people. Um, so more of on a, on a larger scale. And these are difficult, I suppose these are dif at different scales, um, difficult things to, to translate into a textualized um, platform. So maybe there is also something to be said about, um, yeah, this, the limitations and, and also whether this notion of textual heritage can help us um, opening up the category. Yeah, so really again- we got a, a link about this, I think, about the, uh, from Benedetta oh, Bessi. Yeah. This, I think, is a project of, of gathering and recording oral and art. Collecting so oral heritage. Thank you. So there was uh, there was also some during the coffee break we were we were also talking about um, we were talking about the geographical element as well a little bit um, how things change over and how this geographical element was also present in uh, in both Professor Nelson's and and uh, Dr. I and and uh, Gayatri is not yet but soon <laughs> soon. Um, so I think all three presentations really made that um, very clear. This is perhaps something we, do, we didn't expect, right, Eduardo, to have uh, such a geographical... Yes, not, not we, were, we were looking for something that was both uh, interdisciplinary, but with a fil rouge to, to, that, to make the, you know, the things and the discussion more uh, meaningful, I, I think. For this first day, we, we kind of got the point, and maybe we can go to for the, the final to close the, the first day. If there aren't any other uh, questions, um, I don't really see any hands raised. Okay, so. maybe tomorrow we have more. We will have more time for discussion, as the the, the day will be a little bit shorter. We, we will have just uh, the keynote of. Uh, Professor Harvey, and then just two uh, presentations. So if you, you you can reflect on what we talked today, and and uh, we welcome you uh, to the second and third day. Yes. Okay. We, if so, if you have time and and you can manage uh, the time difference, um, it would be lovely to see as many of you as possible again tomorrow and on Wednesday. Thank you so much for to everyone for uh, being here today, particularly Professor Deneke, thank you so much for your keynote, which really uh, put it everything out there on the table <laughs> from the start on the table, <laughs> amazingly. So yeah, I think this is it for today and we'll see you tomorrow, we hope. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Have a good evening.